So in this video, I'm going to be going through a complete overview of the case and evidence against Lucy Letby. Now this video is going to offer a more balanced viewpoint because it's going to be taking a look at the judges summing up. This was given by Justice James Goss before the jury retired to consider the verdicts. This video will also offer perspectives from both Lucy Letby's defence as well as the prosecution's case against Lucy Letby. The judge, Mr Justice James Goss, is now beginning his summing up. He says the prosecution case is there was deliberate harm at the Countess of Chester Hospital neonatal unit, sometimes repeated attempts on the same infants, and some of those infants died. He says after child O and child P died and child Q collapsed on successive days in June 2016, Lucy Letby was confined to clerical duties. He reminds the jury of the background to the offences alleged on the indictment. He says the Countess of Chester Hospital is and was busy. He says the jury are now familiar with the tertiary system of hospitals, with the Countess a level 2 unit, routinely providing care to babies of 27 plus weeks gestation. The jury have been provided with a guide and walkthrough recordings of the unit. One room, room 1, the ICU room, had four incubators and two computers, plus other pieces of equipment. Room 2 was the HDU. Rooms 3 and 4 were special care babies' rooms. He tells the court the last evidence heard was from Lorenzo Mansuti, an experienced plumber at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The women's and children's building was built in the 1960s and there were issues with the plumbing. There was an incident between 2015 and 2016 where the hand basin backed up with foul water. There was also another incident where room 4's floor flooded after a backup sink overflowed. None of the incidents reported happened on the days when the alleged offences took place. In regard to staffing levels, consultant Dr John Gibbs had said in evidence it would have been better if there were more consultants but refused to say the staffing level at the time compromised the care of neonatal infants. He says every year up to 2015, the number of deaths at the neonatal unit was within the number to be expected and less than the national average. Between 2015 and 2016, the number of deaths increased significantly including the number of unusual events. The defence said this was a consequence of higher admissions and a higher number of infants with more complex needs. In evidence, Letby was asked about her relationship with other staff. She said she had no problem or issue with any of the doctors and had a normal working relationship with them at the time, except for one female doctor she did not get on that well with. She said she loved one male doctor as a friend, but there was no loving relationship between the two of them. She later said four doctors had conspired against her falsely, Dr Stephen Breary, Dr Ravi Jayram, Dr John Gibbs and one other. Moving on to the care of the babies, the judge says established BAPM gold standard guidelines had one designated nurse to one ICU baby, one nurse to two HDU babies and one nurse to four special care babies. He says nursing notes would be written retrospectively on computers. They had an accurate electronic timing of the start and completion of the note. He says nurses were asked about staffing levels. The court had heard from one nurse, quote, Sometimes there were more babies on the unit than there were meant to be. 2015 to 2016 was a busy period, with more babies with higher acuity. Staff were giving up breaks to provide care. Another nurse said it was always quite busy. Dr Breary accepted nursing levels were lower than the gold standard guidelines. He added their levels were similar to other neonatal units and staffing levels were better than those around Cheshire. The court heard the other units did not have the mortality levels. The judge says the jury should consider if suboptimal care was a factor in the collapses of the babies. He says in a few cases it is accepted there was suboptimal care. He said let be accepted herself that suboptimal care played little or no part in most of the baby's cases. He says defence barrister Benjamin Myers KC 
repeatedly suggested that doctors had gone out of their way to damage the defendant by blaming her for suboptimal failures in care. He says she did nothing to harm any baby. The judge says it's up to the jury to find out who is telling the truth and who is reliable. The judge says in two cases, two babies received insulin when it was wholly inappropriate to do so. The prosecution say there is no doubt it was added intentionally. The prosecution say the chances of more than one person acting in that way, administering insulin, is not realistic. He adds, the defence invite the jury to question the samples and the lack of harm caused to the infants if they had been poisoned by insulin. He says the prosecution say the intention was endangering the lives of the two babies. The judge says the prosecution referred to a list of reoccurring factors for babies in this case. He says for the defence, they say Letby was a committed, hard-working nurse, and if there was someone intent on harming children, it was not her. The judge now gives the background to Letby, starting as a nurse at the Countess of Chester Hospital in 2012 as a Band 5 nurse. The court has heard Letby always strive to go on every course she could. In March, April 2015, Letby had completed a six-month course including a placement at Liverpool Women's Hospital. She qualified in the speciality of caring for intensive care babies. She was the only Band 5 nurse, along with Bernadette Butterworth, to have that qualification. The judge says Letby has no previous convictions. He says it is entirely for the jury to attach the weight of the defendant's previous character. Letby had said she had cared for hundreds of babies and that hurting a baby was completely against everything a nurse is. Colleague Christopher Booth confirmed she was conscientious, hard-working and willing to help. Another colleague said Letby would remain friends with the parents of babies on Facebook. Arian Powell said Letby was an exceptionally good nurse. Letby had a passion for working in the intensive care side and staff knew she enjoyed that side of care. The judge says Letby's health was good and she did not take time off work in 2015 or 2016. She was flexible, living at Ash House, accommodation at the Countess, then at a flat between 2014 to 2015, then back to Ash House until April 6, 2016, when she moved into her home on Westbourne Road in Chester. Letby was often asked to do more than a required number of shifts per month. She was devastated when taken off clinical duties in 2016. She had prided herself on being very competent. Letby registered a grievance in September 2016. It was at that time she learned she was being blamed for the deaths and that that was sickening and her mental health deteriorated. She was arrested at her home in July 2018. She was interviewed, then moved to Hereford to be with her parents. A search was conducted of her Chester home. The judge refers to expert witnesses who have given evidence in the case. He says the jury would expect to hear evidence from experts with relevant expertise. Their role is to be a witness, not an advocate. He says the defence have criticised that evidence and will come to that when going through the relevant cases. He says the jury are entitled to consider their opinions when coming to the conclusions on the case. It is up to them to consider some or all of their evidence. He says their evidence is part of the case and the jury should not consider it in isolation. It should be considered in the context of expert, clinical and relevant circumstantial evidence. The experts did exclude some reasons for collapses based on their knowledge and expertise. The judge now refers to the case of child A, the twin of child B. He recalls the events of their birth and the collapse. Child A's cause of death was unascertained. The prosecution case is child A did not die of any natural cause, but instead had air deliberately injected intravenously with the intention to kill. The defence say Letby did nothing to harm child A and raised issues with the long line. The judge details what neonatal unit staff were recorded and recalled doing for child A before the collapse. He says there were issues citing a cannula, which can happen. A long line was later inserted by registrar Dr David Harkness. 
Nurse Melanie Taylor came on duty. Child A was stable and satisfactory, and the nurse had no concerns. She ended her shift at 8pm and handed over to the defendant, who came in at 7.27pm. She confirmed a 10% dextrose bag had been prescribed to be given via the long line. All three babies that night in room one required long lines, child A, child B and one other. Dr Harkness was unsure if the long line was in the perfect position. He believed it was imperfect but good enough to be used. Dr Evans said the position was not a problem and there was no evidence of the end of the line puncturing the heart lining. He said if there was, it would show up on post-mortem examination. Dr Sandy Bowen said he was not in an optimal position but safe to use. Melanie Taylor said she was sitting at the computer in room 1 when child A started to deteriorate. The alarm sounded and Melanie Taylor went over thinking the baby was going to recover. She said let B was administering Neopuff. She says it was a bit of a blur. Let B said she was not initially intending to work that night shift but was happy to help after being asked to work. There was a lot going on and she said Melanie Taylor, being a sterile nurse, was administering fluids. Child A's hands and feet were white at the time of the desaturation, centrally pale and poor perfusion. An emergency crash call was put out. Dr Rachel Lambie had said child A looked like child B, pale and blotchy all over. The defence said her original police statement referred to child A being pale with white hands. The defence draw your attention to the difference, the judge says. Dr Harkness had given a description of the blotchy rash, saying it was only seen again by him in the case of child E. The defence criticised him for not including the description in medical notes at the time, or in notes to the coroner. Dr Ravi Jayram had said it was highly unusual in the way that child A was deteriorating and his heart rate fell, even after intubation. At the time, he noted child A's pale skin. His explanation for not including the pink patches skin discoloration to the coroner, but mentioning it to the police later, was he had not considered it clinically relevant at the time. He said it was a matter of regret he had not mentioned it. He said he could not explain how child A collapsed. He said he read a document in a medical paper about skin discoloration in a case of air embolus. He said he had not been influenced by that paper when it came to that explanation. The judge is now referring to Lucy Letby's police interview, where she recalled red, purple, blotchy markings on child A, which she thought were signs of an infection. She believed there was an issue with the long line and Melanie Taylor had connected the fluids to child A. Child A's death was not expected or anticipated. She said she thought the bag of fluid was, quote, not what they thought it was, but they had checked it afterwards. She said she did not keep in touch with the parents and did not recall what she did with the handover notes. She said she did not know much about air embolisms and all the staff were meticulous about precautionary checks to prevent that happening. She denied pushing air through the line. She could not recall using social media to search for the mother of child A and when asked to explain searches for the mother on Facebook, she said she could not do so. Letby said the fluid bag should be contained and put in the sluice room for checking. She said staffing levels contributed to the death of child A, citing difficulties with the long line and child A's lack of fluids for several hours. She said if air embolus was the cause, Melanie Taylor was responsible. She disagreed with the description of skin discoloration given by a nursing colleague and Dr Harkness. She said searching for the parents was a common pattern of behaviour for her. The judge says Mr Myers repeatedly expressed his opinions on the merits of the expert evidence, questioning and challenging them. He says that is his right, but it's up to the jury to determine the reliability of the expert evidence. The judge refers to Professor Owen Arthur's evidence, who considered each case on its own merits. Professor Arthurs was provided with radiograph images of child A. He noted the umbilical catheter was slightly in the wrong place and there was a line of gas in front of the spine on one of the images, which was an unusual finding. 
He said it was so unusual he reviewed other cases at Great Ormond Street Hospital to compare for a similar image. He said such gas would normally only be seen in heavy impacts such as road traffic incidents. This could obviously be discounted. The other usual cause would be overwhelming infections in organs of the body such as sepsis, but child A did not have any such identifiers. He said he had not seen this much gas in any baby other than in the case of child D. He said it was consistent with air administered to him, but not diagnostic of it. In cross-examination, he said he found no unexplained cases and accepted this was an observational study, not a controlled one. The judge says for obvious reasons, the latter could not be carried out. Professor Arthurs said radiographic evidence of air embolus was rare, and in suspected cases, seeing anything on the radiograph was also rare. He said the absence of it on the radiograph did not rule that cause out. He said one of the reasons is the imaging of the event is not important. The main priority is to save the life. An x-ray taken an hour later wouldn't show anything. The judge refers to the expert witness Dr Andreas Marnarides' evidence. His expertise, the court is told, is on the pathology of conditions on those who had died. He said there was no evidence of infection or any other abnormalities. He could see from his study empty structures of fat or air in child A. After testing, he ruled out the former. He said he could see evidence of air in the brain when the baby was alive. The findings could not be taken as absolute proof of air embolus. He said there was no evidence of any natural cause of death or any of natural disease. He took the view that child A's death was of air embolus via injection. The judge refers to Dr Evans and his role in providing background evidence for child A. He said, on the whole, babies don't suddenly collapse. He said child A was the fifth case he looked at and the cause of the collapse was unusual. He said as he looked at further cases, he noticed a pattern as he received more evidence. He said Dr Evans' evidence came for criticism by the defence. He had not been in practice since 2009, and the defence said he had constructed theories and acted as an investigator and was biased, putting himself forward at the outset. The judge says the prosecution point to a large number of incidents for review with no apparent reasons for an event or death. They point to Dr Evans' long experience in neonatology and provided clear evidence in child F and child L that identified two babies on the unit were being poisoned. The prosecution say Dr Evans was not handed other potentially incriminating evidence such as shift patterns for staff. Dr Evans said child A was stable and as well as could be expected before the collapse. Repeated attempts to insert a UVC or long line may have caused upset to child A but would not have caused the collapse, he said. The lack of fluids would not make a material difference. Bright pink skin discoloration would be unusual in a baby's collapse but skin discoloration is not diagnostic of an air embolus alone, Dr Evans said. He denied he had been influenced in reaching his conclusion by a 1989 medical paper. He said in Child A's case, there had been colour change, sudden and unexpected collapse, air in various parts of the body, and no explanation for death. He said it was probably an air embolus intravenously. The judge refers to Dr Sandy Bowen and her evidence for Child A. He says the defence accused her of lacking independence and enthusiastically supported Dr Evans' evidence. She repeatedly denied these assertions and said her views were her own. The judge says it's up to the jury to assess the validity of the defence's assertions. Dr Bowen said neither the UVC or long line contributed to child A's collapse. She said child A was so well that there was consideration to giving him feeds and babies doing well do not develop pink fluctuating rashes that come and go. She said, excluding other possibilities, air embolus was the only plausible explanation, and believed air getting in accidentally was extremely unlikely. Studies on air emboli should be treated with caution as they are on adults or animals, she said. 
In cross-examination, she said she did not know of any genetic condition that would cause a collapse and death within 24 hours of birth. The judge describes Professor Sally Kinsey's evidence in which she had concluded from the descriptions by doctors and nurses of skin discoloration that child A had had an air embolus. The court had been told of how an air embolus affects the body. She confirmed she had not seen one in her experience, but the descriptions provided were pretty stark. The judge turns to the case of child B and relays the care and events leading up to and the time of her collapse. A nurse colleague said she had her gloves on and was drawing up medication when child B collapsed at 12.30am. Letby had said child B was not breathing. The nurse said child B looked like child A with blotchy discoloration. A cyanose appearance was recorded in the notes. The notes added the colour changed rapidly to purple blotches with white patches. Letby said she'd accepted being in room 1 at the time of the collapse. She said the colleague had alerted her to child B's collapse. Dr Rachel Lambie said the most unusual observation for child B was a quote, dusky pale grey colour then developing widespread blotches of a purple red colour which would flush up then disappear then appear elsewhere. They were flitting all over. It took about 90 minutes for the grey colour to disappear and be replaced by pink, she said. She said this was a very unusual event, which she has not seen before or since, and child B recovered quickly. Blood gas results came back as normal. Let B said she had been asked to get a camera to get a photo of child B, but when she had returned, the discoloration had gone. A female doctor recalled purple blotching to the mid-right abdomen and right hand, which she was puzzled by. The rash was so florid and so very unusual, she said, and its quick disappearance was not normal. Dr Evans said child B was stable prior to the collapse. The collapse was either the result of smothering or air embolus. He said if the cause was hypoxia or infection, the effects would stay. He said the fact child B survived meant it was likely less air was administered or it was administered more slowly. Dr Bowen said child B was compromised at birth but responded very well to resuscitation and breathing support measures. The circumstances of the collapse were very disturbing and there were no other warning signs. The dislodging of the nasal prongs for child B had been resolved. She based her air embolus conclusion on florid skin colour changes and ruling out other causes. The defence say it cannot be excluded that child B's collapse was a natural event. The judge refers to the case of child C. He says medical experts found it difficult to conclude the cause of death, but Dr Marnarides said it was air administered into his stomach via the nasogastric tube. Let me said she did nothing harmful to child C, and a cause such as a gastrointestinal blockage cannot be excluded, that child C should have been treated at a tertiary unit, and there was a failure to react to bile aspirates, vomiting, and an overall lack of care. Child C was born in good condition and was on the margins of being treated at the Level 2 Countess of Chester Hospital neonatal unit, the jury is told. The judge recalls the events leading up to Child C's death on the morning of June 14th. Nothing stood out as worrying for Child C from observations, but there was caution for his care. Professor Arthurs said radiographs for June 12th showed left-sided chest infection and marked dilation of the bowel. Symptoms of this included CPAP belly, NEC, sepsis or air embolus. Bile was later noted on Child C's blanket on June 13th and 2 mil of black stained fluid was obtained on aspirates. No desaturations were observed. Bile aspirates was a concern in neonates but not that unusual and not a major cause of concern the court had heard. Dr Gibbs said the bile for Child C was a worry but the aspirates were not increasing and his overall observations were satisfactory an obstruction would have been found post-mortem. Dr Sally Ogden said the observations were a concern and the x-ray showed a loopy bowel. Child C was still pink and well perfused and he had no concerns with breathing and the abdomen was soft to touch, which was reassuring. 
Dr Gibbs had no particular concerns about child C that day on June 13th. Babies with NEC develop a hardened abdomen, the jury was told. Messages showed Letby wanted to, quote, throw myself back in to the neonatal unit. She said that meant getting back into looking after babies, as that was what she was taught at Liverpool Women's Hospital. The messages included Letby saying, quote, From a confidence point of view, I need to take an ITU baby soon. Sophie Ellis, a Band 5 nurse, not intensive care unit trained, was supported by a Band 6 nurse that night shift to be the designated nurse for child C in room 1. At the start of the night shift, there was a hope to start child C on feeds. He was pink, well perfused, active and alert. At 10.34pm, Letby said she had done a couple of meds in room 1. She believed Sophie Ellis didn't have the skill in caring for premature babies. Sophie Ellis was alerted to child C's desaturation. She said she had been alerted to the desaturation by Letby, who had said, quote, he's just dropped his heart rate and saturations. This was something she had not put in the nursing notes, but something she said to police. She said she did not do so at the time, as it was ultimately a traumatic event. She said she did not do anything to child C and didn't see anything being done to him. Letby was, quote, stood at the incubator at the far side. A nursing colleague said she believed she saw Melanie Taylor and Sophie Ellis by child C. Child C was not breathing, very blotchy, and was not aware if Letby was in the room. Melanie Taylor said in evidence when she approached the incubator, Letby was already there. She said in police interview she was in room one feeding another baby and was called over by Sophie Ellis not mentioning Letby. Letby said she had very little independent memory of events. She said she had given evidence on child C's collapse having been placed there in the room by Sophie Ellis' account. Dr Gibbs said efforts to intubate were unsuccessful due to swollen vocal cords. Sophie Ellis said she got upset at the situation after Child C's mother arrived as it was overwhelming and she had not been in that kind of situation before. Lucy Letby said to her, do you want me to take over? Sophie Ellis said yes and left room one. Dr Catherine Davies said even the smallest, sickest babies would respond to resuscitation, but Child C did not. Dr Gibbs said he could not find anything that would allow the heart to restart long after resuscitation had stopped and could not understand that from a natural disease process. The mother said in an agreed statement she recalled CPR being performed on child C. The heart rate had fallen unexpectedly and rapidly. She says she did not grasp the gravity of the situation and was shocked when asked by a nurse if she wanted a priest. She asked if child C was going to die. The nurse, described to be in her mid-twenties, replied, Yes, I think so. The father of child C said a nurse, who he later believed to be Letby, had said to the parents in the family room, You said your goodbyes now, do you want to put him in here? Referring to a basket for child C. He said child C's mother said, He's not dead yet, and the nurse then backtracked. Letby had accepted she had made searches for Child C's parents on Facebook 10 hours after, but could not remember doing so or why. She questioned whether she was the nurse who said the you said your goodbyes comment and did not recall saying it. She said she was very sad for the parents. In evidence, she said she did not recall any specific contact with the parents. She said the search for the parents were as they were, quote, very much on her mind at that time, as you don't forget events like those which happened to child C. The nursing colleague recalled asking Letby more than once to look after her designated babies that night and it was not part of her responsibilities to be in the family room. That was for Melanie Taylor. Dr Kokai carried out a post-mortem examination for child C. He noted a distended colon which Dr Marna Reedis said was not an abnormality. He said the potential complication was a twisted colon that would lead to obvious symptoms of pain. There was evidence of acute pneumonia. Dr Marnaridis said one could die of pneumonia or with pneumonia. He said the former was plausible, but upon hearing further clinical evidence, he reviewed his opinion. 
He said babies dying of pneumonia experienced gradual deterioration, which was not seen in this case. He said he revisited the cause of death, viewing images of the distended stomach and no evidence of NEC. Professor Arthur said the small bowel was dilated. Dr. Marnarides observed a dilated stomach and bowel and noted child C had been off CPAP for over 12 hours. No air had been obtained from aspirates before the collapse. He had never known CPAP belly being the cause of an arrest in a baby in his years of experience. He said, in his opinion, the cause of child C's collapse was of excessive air administered into the stomach via the nasogastric tube. The judge says Dr Evans said the pneumonia infection did not cause child C's collapse. The cause was difficult to explain. Initially, he said it was, quote, unexplained. He said excessive air in the stomach can cause splinting of the diaphragm. The judge said he did not give that conclusion before giving evidence, and it was not advanced in his eight reports. Dr Evans denied he was coming up with things now to support an allegation of harm. Dr Evans said, from an academic point of view, air embolus could not be excluded. The judge says Mr Myers was critical of this late conclusion. Dr Bowen had said her conclusion of the, quote, bubble in the stomach was if the NGT was not on free drainage, then it could have been accumulation of gas by CPAP. The alternative was the deliberate administration of air via the NGT. She said child C died with pneumonia, but not because of pneumonia, and that would have made child C less responsive to resuscitation. In reaction to questions about bowel obstructions, she said child C would have had a distended abdomen and normal bowel sounds would not have been heard. The judge said Dr Bowen had added there were no clinical indicators of obstruction. The trial judge now turns to the case of child D. He recalls the baby girl's birth and that she died 36 hours later on June 22nd, 2015. The prosecution's case is air was administered intravenously. He says the guideline was for child D to be given antibiotics at birth due to the gestational age and this had not been done. The prosecution said while child D died with pneumonia, not of pneumonia, the defence say you cannot be sure of that, and the cause could have been infection. Dr Sandy Bowen said child D should have been screened at birth due to her low temperature, which was a sign of infection. Child D was placed on CPAP breathing support. Her heart sounds and capillary refill were normal, abdomen was soft and non-distended, and the chest was clear. The parents were informed it was likely sepsis. Child D stabilised on CPAP. Child D was intubated and ventilated after showing signs of acidosis. An x-ray showed very little abnormal, according to Professor Owen Arthurs. Child D was given the protein surfactant. Child D was weaned off the ventilator and extubated. Dr Elizabeth Newby said child D was a little stiff and hard to handle and felt there was an element of infection. Dr Bowen said child D had signs of pneumonia but was recovering. Child D's mother recalled an event when she arrived on the unit and let B was quote, hovering round child D, not doing much, holding a clipboard. She asked if everything was okay. Let B replied, everything was fine. The mother added, she just stuck around. The mother said Letby was told to go away, or words to that effect. Child D's father did not recall this event. He recalled he was given a Father's Day card on June 21st by the staff. He said nurses were friendly and warm and was made to feel welcome when he went to the unit. Professor Arthurs said a radiograph of Child D from the afternoon of June 21st showed the catheter was in the wrong position. There was a sign of infection, but nowhere near as prevalent as that seen for Child C. Child D showed big improvements and good progress on June 21st. This was in relation to blood tests and respiratory efforts, although she was not stable enough to have a lumbar puncture. She was responding well and her tone was reasonable. Child D desaturated to the 80s when attempts were made to take her off CPAP. 
Dr. Sarah Rylance was happy with Child D's clinical condition by this stage. Quote, stable and making good progress. The judge says shift leader and designated nurse for Child D in room 1 on June 21st or 22nd was Caroline Oakley. Letby was designated nurse for two other babies in room 1. Child D was on nasal CPAP in air with satisfactory gases. The readings for 7.30pm to 12.30am were all normal and she was happy with Child D. Aspirates found had minimal importance as Child D was not being fed at this time. Caroline Oakley said she assumed she began an infusion at 1.25am being the designated nurse, but the writing on the infusion note was not hers. One of the nurses on duty was aware Caroline Oakley had been on her break and checked Child D who was fine. While she was at her computer, she was alerted to alarms and found the monitor was showing Child D was desaturating at 1.30am. She recalled Let B was there. She noted Child D had a rash on her trunk and arms and it was quote, not like a normal rash, this was like a mosaic like vessels of blood meeting with each other. She said she had not seen anything like it before. She said her trunk and legs went a mottling colour and it was very odd. She discussed it with Dr Andrew Brunton. Child D then settled and discoloration seemed to disappear and dissipate. Caroline Oakley said the rash was quote, different to mottling and it was very unusual. She quote, had an episode but responded very quickly. Another senior nurse said she had a limited memory of events. She remembered Child D being stiff and having a rash on her trunk, which was an odd, unusual rash. The judge says at 3am there was a second event. Caroline Oakley said Child D was crying and desaturating and the skin was discoloured but less than before. Dr Brunton recalled Child D was agitated and upset and thought it was something to do with the face mask. He saw skin discoloration, but this was not as obvious as before. A prescribed saline bolus was signed for Child D at 3.20am by Caroline Oakley and Lucy Letby. Nurse Oakley said they were happy with Child D and she would be provided with expressed breast milk. She said if Child D was unstable, she would not have changed Child D's nappy. Observations were, quote, fine by 3.30am. At 3.45am, Child D's monitor was alarming. Caroline Oakley found Child D had stopped breathing and was apneic. Dr Emily Thomas heard the call for help. She asked a nurse to put out a crash call for Dr Brunton. He ran when he was crash called. Full resuscitation was carried out on Child D with the assistance of doctors and nurses, including Lucy Letby. There were, quote, secretions plus 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 from the nose and mouth. The parents were informed and went to the unit. After 28 minutes of resuscitation attempts, it was decided to stop. At 4.50am, Dr Newby had a discussion with Child D's parents on the sudden collapse. She agreed babies can suddenly collapse, but was surprised Child D did. She, quote, did not appear to be a baby in extremis. A nurse had a conversation with Lucy Letby about the drugs administered during resuscitation. Letby asked the nurse how she knew the doses to give. The nurse replied she knew them from her years of experience and recommended Letby learn them as well. Dr Marnarides said pneumonia was likely to be present at birth for child D. Professor Arthurs talked of a black line in front of the spine indicating gas in the great vessels which was unusual in children who had died without an explanation. It was present in two other children, one of whom was child A. There was, quote, more air in child D than child A. One explanation was someone was injecting air into the child and the radiograph images were consistent with, but not diagnostic of, externally administered air to child D. Dr Marnarides said the presence of air in such a vessel was significant. He said, from a pathology point of view, air embolus could not be proved. He said there was no other natural disease that could explain Child D's death. He said, in his opinion, Child D died with, not from, pneumonia. He concluded the likely explanation was air embolus. 
Dr. Evans said the 1.30am episode was very surprising and unusual as Child D had been responding to treatment and was a stable baby. He said Child D had symptoms of early onset pneumonia and had developed that before birth but was making a recovery. He said he could not think of any events which would end with unsuccessful resuscitation and the cause was an air embolus. Dr. Bowen peer-reviewed Dr. Evans' reports and conclusions. She said the striking feature of all events was they were very sudden and unexpected and they came with mottling of the skin. She said it was a concern that child D was crying in the second event. She said although antibiotics were given late, there was nothing clinically to suggest child D was going to collapse. Quote, this was not a picture of a baby with pneumonia severe enough to collapse. She was clear infection did not cause the sudden collapse. There were episodes of discoloration which was consistent with the limited recorded events of air embolus. She concluded air had been administered intravenously, causing an air embolus. The judge says Lisa Walker, a band 4 nurse, talked about an event of being in room 3 where Let B was feeding babies via a nasogastric tube. The alarm on the portable monitor went off and Lisa Walker went over to help. Let B stopped the feed and began stimulation for the baby but was not getting a response. She saw colleague Kate Bissell walking past and shouted for help as the baby was not picking up. A doctor working on a computer went over to help. The baby was given gentle stimulation and picked up. Lisa Walker said Letby asked her quite firmly why she asked for help. She said Letby was quite cross and the band 4 nurse didn't respond. She said Letby's demeanour was that she would have been fine and didn't need any help. Letby in police interview denied doing anything deliberately harmful to child D. She said she could not remember doing Facebook searches for the parents of Child D three days after Child D's death. She said she could not recall why she said Child D looked like having overwhelming sepsis or that there was an element of fate in babies. In evidence, Letby said she didn't really remember the night shift. She said she would have been caring for her designated babies and assisting colleagues with theirs. She did not remember being called into room 1 at 1.25am Child D desaturating at 3am or Child D collapsing at 3.45am. The trial judge now refers to the case of twin boys Child E and Child F, dealing with Child E first. Both twins were born in good condition, the jury is told. Child E died less than six days later. The court had been told Child E was very premature. A doctor agreed Child E was capable of dramatic changes in his condition. The day after Child E was born, the mother went to cuddle Child E as he was on CPAP breathing support. On July 30th, the boys were progressing really well and due to a high blood glucose level, Child E was given a low dose of insulin. The twins were doing well and stable on August 1st with time out of his incubator. On the day of August 3rd, a nurse said the mother was on the unit with long periods of skin-to-skin -skin contact and Child E could have as many cuddles as he liked. Child E was pink and well perfused with regular circulatory system and a cautious feeding regime. Everything remained well, intravenous caffeine was given as prescribed. The judge says Dr Emily Thomas had examined Child E and there were no signs he was unwell. Observations were normal with a soft non-distended abdomen and no suspicious aspirates. He was quote well and stable. A nurse noted Child E's blood sugar was higher than normal and his insulin infusion was restarted at a lower dose. Antibiotics were given as prescribed. A doctor said the observations were normal and not a cause for concern. The high blood sugar level was relatively normal for a neonate and would not lead to the sort of collapse seen hours later. Child E's mother recalled giving cares to Child E, then going upstairs to provide milk between 7 to 8.30 p.m., the latter being the time of the night shift handover. Letby was the designated nurse for Child E and Child F in room 1. 
Let B said the 9pm feed was omitted because of 16mm mucky bile stained aspirate. This was discarded and the SHO was informed, told to omit the feed. She said the doctor's name was not always made on nursing notes. Child E's mother recalled going to see Child E and Child F at 9pm. Let B was there at the workstation, the mother said, and she added Child E was crying like nothing before. It was, quote, horrendous. She saw blood coming out of his mouth. It was not on or going on to anything like a dribble pattern. It was blood. It was smudged and didn't look completely dry. It was darker than normal. The mother said she was panicked and asked Letby why Child E was bleeding. She said Letby said that NGT had been rubbing at the back of the throat. Letby did not recall saying this. In cross-examination, she said she did not tell the mother this and would not tell the parents to go away. She accepted that in an interview for Child N, she had said an NGT could cause bleeding. The mother said she accepted what Letby had said and did as she was told to go back to the postnatal ward as Letby was an authority figure. But she was concerned. She said she made a call to Child E's father. The judge refers to phone call data at 9.11pm. The father said the mother was upset at the time of this call. Midwife Susan Brooks recalled Child E's mother had said to let her know if there were any updates overnight from the unit as one of the twins had deteriorated slightly. She had recalled at 11.30pm the neonatal unit rang to bring Child E's mother to the unit in 30 minutes as Child E had a bleed. Let be said in police interview she could not recall the events with Child E's mother and could not remember any specific bleed. She said the 14 mil bleed later, after 10pm, was very concerning, and in evidence that was when she first saw bleeding on child E. The judge says there are significant conflicts between Letby's evidence and that of the parents. He says the defence say the mother's evidence is unreliable in relation to timings. The judge says Dr David Harkness noted at 11.40pm Child E had a desaturation with colour changes on the abdomen. Quote, a strange pattern over the tummy which didn't fit with poor perfusion. The legs and upper arms were pink in normal colour. He said the only other time he had seen this was with Child A and not since. The patches were 1-2cm to two centimeters big and he carried out an emergency intubation. Let me said there was a purple block on the abdomen for child E at 11.40pm. She said it was not like Dr Harkness had described. She said she found child E's death very traumatic and filled in a Datix form. She said the medical team were late administering a blood transfusion. The defence challenged the decision not to give a blood transfusion earlier. A doctor had said she did not believe the collapse was due to blood loss and that blood transfusion had its own risks. She said she did not believe, even with hindsight, Child E should have had a blood transfusion at that point. The mother had contact with Letby after Child E died. She said Letby bathed Child E. In Letby's evidence, she said the parents bathed Child E. A doctor said at the time she believed Child E had died of NEC and that a post-mortem examination would not tell the parents any more and would delay their transfer back home. She had said NEC was the most likely cause of the gastrointestinal bleed. No post-mortem examination was carried out. She completely agreed that with hindsight she should have requested a post-mortem examination. She apologised to the parents for not pushing for that having wanted to avoid further distress for them. Let B said in messaging with colleague Jennifer Jones Key in response to the unit being on a terrible run that child E had had a hemorrhage and could have happened to anyone. She said the searches for the parents of child E and child F more than once on Facebook was part of a normal pattern of behaviour for her, as was taking a picture of the sympathy card she sent to the parents. She said it was something for her to remember, as was a photo of her shift pattern. The judge says Professor Arthur said there was no evidence on the radiograph image for child E of an air embolus, but that did not exclude it may have happened. He said there were no features of NEC on the x-ray. 
Professor Sally Kinsey said child E did not have a blood clotting problem. Dr Evans said child E was incredibly stable at increased risk of NEC but suitably treated. He said if a baby had NEC they would become gradually unwell and child E would not have coped with handling in any way. The abdomen would have been distended along with other observations. He said NEC was not a viable explanation. Dr Evans said there was a significant haemorrhage and something must have caused this. He noted the unusual discoloration which prior to this case he had only seen in literature as evidence of an air embolus. He said there must have been some sort of trauma caused by a piece of equipment such as an introducer. He said there was no innocent explanation for it. He said he has never seen an ulcer cause this type of bleed. He said the haemorrhage was caused by trauma. Dr Bowen says she formed her own opinion on the case and refuted going along with Dr Evans' conclusions. She said the decision not to hold a post-mortem examination was a poor one. Dr Bowen said babies with NEC do not go from being well one minute to very unwell the next. The 16 mil aspirate before the 9pm feed struck her as being odd and did not match Child E's clinical picture at that point. She was at a loss to describe where that had come from. She said that NGT insertion can sometimes cause very minor bleeding in a baby, but not a haemorrhage. The blood vomit was an extremely unusual feature. Dr Bowen had never seen a baby have a gastric haemorrhage in this way, the court is told. She believed child E died of an air embolus. The judge now refers to the case of child F. On July the 31st, 2015, child F was given a dose of insulin to treat high blood sugar levels and he stabilised. On the day of August 3rd, other than a minor respiratory issue when child F was taken off CPAP, all was well and he was tolerating feeds. The prosecution alleged child F was given insulin via a nutrition bag on August 4th to 5th and that the next bag hung up on noon on August 5th, a stock bag from the fridge, had a similar amount of insulin put in it. The jury is reminded of the relationship between insulin and insulin C peptide levels naturally occurring in the body and the relationship between those two in synthetic insulin. A new TPN fluid nutrition bag was hung up at 12.25am on August 5th for child F. Yvonne Griffiths said the fridge contains stock bags and insulin. That fridge was kept locked with one set of keys, initially in the hands of the shift leader, but available on request. There was no system for signing the keys in or out. Child F was the only baby on that night shift of August 4th to 5th who was receiving TPN. Professor Peter Heinmarsh says the bag administered at 12.25am had insulin in. Dr Harkness attended the unit that night and noted child F had vomits and was tachycardic with a heart rate of 200 beats per minute, but otherwise well. Professor Heimarsh said these were signs of hypoglycemia. Doses of dextrose and salt water were administered. Kate Bissell and Banford nurses said they had never added anything to a TPN bag. Dr Gibbs said the fall in child F's blood sugar level was unexpected. At 10.30am, a new long line was to be inserted in child F as instructed by Dr. Saladi with the removal of the old one. The fluids were stopped while the line was replaced and child F's blood sugar level rose. A new TPN bag from the stock bags in the fridge, of which there are about five, was hung up at noon and fluids resumed. Child F's blood sugar levels remained low in the afternoon after dextrose boluses at 3pm and 5pm. The TPN bag was stopped at 7pm. The judge details how the insulin blood sample was taken to the laboratory in Liverpool and analysed and the results came back showing an undetectable level of insulin C peptide compared to a high level of insulin. It was suggested that the sample be referred for further tests, but child F had recovered by this stage so the sample was stored for seven days before being disposed of. Professor Highmarsh said the increased blood sugar readings for child F during the afternoon were consistent with them following fresh bolus administrations of dextrose. 
The blood glucose had started to rise spontaneously between 10.30 to noon, Professor Highmarsh said, during the time the fluids were not being administered. He said the dangers of low blood sugar include confusion, seizures, brain damage and in serious cases, death. The judge says the court has heard the most likely cause of insulin administration was for it to be administered intravenously. Professor Highmarsh says the most likely way for this was via an infusion at a rate of 1.2 units per hour and calculated that 0.6 ml of insulin, a clear fluid, was added. He says the same amount would have been needed to have been added to the stock bag. He concluded that the only explanation was for child F to have received bags contaminated with insulin. Dr Evans concluded child F had received insulin via the TPN bag. Dr Bowen agreed and said two bags must have been contaminated with insulin. When interviewed, let be remembered child F as the surviving twin of child E. She agreed her signature was for a TPN bag and could not remember if she had administered the TPN or not. The bags were kept at the top of the fridge, the insulin at the bottom. Letby said medication would not be added to a TPN bag. She agreed the blood sugar level for child F at 1.54am was quote dangerously low and denied harming child F or giving him any insulin. Letby, in evidence, said she believed her nursing colleague had hung up the TPN bag. She confirmed she did not know about C-peptide at that time. She knew adding insulin was life-threatening to a child like child F. She said Facebook searches for the parents was because the twins were on her mind. The judge now refers to the case of child G. Child G was born in a tertiary unit and was very premature weighing just under one pound three ounces. She was at the margins of survival when born. On August 13th, child G was transferred to the Countess of Chester Hospital and was stable. Let be said she remembered child G who had a lot of problems. The prosecution case is let be deliberately overfed child G. Dr Stephen Breary first reviewed child G on August 22nd and the general trend was one of improvement for the baby girl. She was stable and well, with desaturation self-correcting. The oxygen requirement was continuing to come down. For September 6th to 7th, the night shift, child G was the only baby in room 2, and Letby had a baby in room 1. The prosecution case is after the 2am feed for child G, administered by a colleague, Letby deliberately injected milk and air afterwards. September 7th, 2015 was Child G's 100th day of life and a banner was prepared to celebrate that on the unit. Child G was still on nasal prongs and some oxygen but was stable. A nurse said she usually completed the chart after the feed. The 2am 45ml feed was given via an NGT. Let's be agreed the readings were good at this time. The nurse said an aspirate was taken from Child G for a pH check this level being four. She then went on her break, and when she returned, she found child G had deteriorated with a projectile vomit. The deterioration had come as a surprise to her. Shift leader Elsa Simpson said she was at the nursing station with Letby when she heard child G vomit. When they went over, the alarm for child G went off. There was a large amount of milk and the vomit was on the cot, on the floor and on the chair adjacent to the cot. Respiratory support was given via Neopuff. Letby had said in evidence she had no contact with child G prior to the vomiting episode. She said she was aware child G had a lot of ongoing issues but the observations were good up to that 2am feed. She said she had been with Elsa Simpson when they heard child G vomit and the alarm had gone off. She said when they arrived, no one else was in there. She said they immediately started to give child G Neopuff. She identified a possible problem of the nursing colleague overfeeding child G, but did not believe that to be likely. In police interview, Letby said it was a shock regarding the deaths which transpired between June to September 2015 but didn't feel there was anything that needed to be looked into. She said the nursing colleague was on a break when the vomit happened. She said sometimes babies vomit, but did not often projectile vomit. She said when babies vomit, they can take on air when gasping. 
She added she was not sure the cause of the air in Child G's abdomen. In a separate police interview, Letby said Child G had either received more than 45 ml of milk or had undigested milk from a previous feed. She said it was an oversight from a previous interview that she had not mentioned the vomit going on the floor and the chair by the cot. Dr. Alison Ventress said the vomit had been reported to her. For a description of Child G being in distress and the abdomen purple and distended, she could not recall if that was something she had seen or was told, and the same went for Child G's watery stool and a subsequently improved abdomen. Dr. Ventress was then called urgently to theatre. She said by this time Child G was looking better. She was called out of theatre before 3.30am as Child G was apneic and had desaturated. It took five minutes for the saturations to pick back up. Child G went to room one and had a further profound desaturation. At the time of insertion of an ET tube, blood-stained fluid was noted beneath the vocal cords, which Dr. Ventress noted was unusual. Dr. Breary said he had not seen a projectile vomit in a preterm baby like Child G. There was a further profound desaturation at 6.05 a.m. and the decision was made to reintubate Child G. Quote, Thick secretions plus plus in the mouth and a blood clot in the breathing tube was noted. 100 ml was then aspirated from the NG tube. Dr. Ventra said she was not sure it was air as that was not documented. Dr. Breary took the 100 ml reading to be fluid or milk. Letby's case, the judge says, is she did nothing wrong and did not falsify notes. She accepted air or milk could have been pushed from the feeding syringe into Child G's throat. She denied doing so. Child G was readmitted to Arrow Park Hospital on September 8, 2015 with presumed sepsis. She was very unwell on arrival with severe hypertension. A radiograph, Professor Arthur said, was not a sign of NEC. The baby girl gradually improved to the point of returning to the Countess of Chester Hospital on September 16th. Dr Evans said Child G was compromised by receiving a large volume of air and milk and this was not unique to babies. He proceeded on the basis the stomach of Child G was empty prior to the 2am feed and a pH reading of 4 was indicative of an empty stomach. He said babies fed by NGT do not vomit. He said Child G suffered significant oxygen deprivation which caused irreversible brain damage. He concluded Child G must have had more than 45 ml of milk. Challenged on this, he said this was the first case he looked at and reached his conclusion without looking at any other cases. Dr Bowen said the vomit was extraordinary and said it was impossible to say how big Child G's stomach was but the excess volume of milk would not be much to compromise the lungs. She detailed a number of desaturations and events for Child G in June to July 2015. She concluded that it was clear by September 7th Child G was tolerating feeds. A pH reading of 4 was not consistent with there being a large amount of undigested milk in the stomach. She said if there was, the milk would have neutralised the pH reading to 7. She concluded Child G's stomach was empty. It was put to Dr Bowen that she was modifying her opinion based on the accounts of the nurse and Dr Evans. She refuted that and said she based the level of milk on the pH reading, not anything Dr Evans had said. She concluded Child G must have had a large amount of milk and air administered after the 2am feed. The judge refers to the events on September 21st for Child G during the day shift at 10.20am and 3.40pm. Child G was, the court is told, in a satisfactory condition. He says there was an event at 10.20am, had two projectile vomits and went apneic, colour loss and desaturation to 30%. Letby, the designated nurse, said she remembered the incident and Child G was due to receive immunisations. The event had happened after a 40 ml feed at 10.15am. Child G was being treated as a term baby. Dr Peter Fleming recorded the projectile vomits and that Child G went apneic for 6 to 10 seconds. He discussed the case with Dr Rachel Chang and the course was to leave the NGT on free drainage as the abdomen was distended. 
Chol Ji was to be transferred to room one. Ke had been transferred to a nursing colleague on September 21st. She said Chol Ji's heart rate was high when she took over, but had settled by 12.45pm. After the vomits, Chol Ji was nil by mouth. Dr Chang noted Chol Ji was pale and had a feed delayed, and the baby was not herself. The tummy was soft and distended, so a screen for sepsis was planned. Chol Ji needed to be cannulated, and this required seven attempts, successful on the seventh attempt by Dr Gibbs, by which time Chol Ji had been without fluids for six hours. A nursing colleague remembered Dr Harkness and Dr Gibbs arriving, and believed Chol Ji was behind screens and on a trolley. She said when the doctors finished the procedure, they would let a nurse know, and the baby would be put in the cot. She next saw Chol Ji when Letby called her for help. She saw Letby providing breathing support for Chol Ji, and the nurse could see Chol Ji was a poor colour. The monitor was switched off. She shouted for nurse Caroline Bennion, and Chol Ji responded to treatment and was transferred to room one. Chol Ji was placed in an incubator. Let be in evidence said screens were put up for the procedure for Chol G. She said it was common practice for nurses to look behind screens and said she saw Chol G behind the screen alone on a trolley, blue and not breathing, and the monitor was switched off. She said she was keen to put a datix form about the incident. She said she did not take it further as the nursing colleague said the situation was in hand. She said in police interview it was bad practice for the monitor to be switched off and somebody had made a mistake in leaving Chol Ji unattended behind screens on a trolley with the monitor off. She did not remember making numerous searches for Chol Ji's mother on Facebook. Dr Gibbs accepted the monitor should not have been switched off. He admitted he had no recollection after the cannulation and accepted it was possible and if a nurse said it had happened, then it happened and he apologised for doing so. Dr Harkness said he did not recall the monitor being detached and would probably have told a nurse when they were finished. He said it was possible Chol G was behind a screen unattended. Caroline Bennion recalled Chol G needed to be cannulated. Arian Powell had no recollection of anything untoward clinically being brought to her attention. The prosecution say Letby was incorrect when she messaged a colleague to say Chol G looked rubbish when she took over care for her that morning. Letby accepted she made an error on recalling the timing of the vomit, but said Chol G looked pale on handover. Dr Evans said he had 4,000 pages of material for Chol G alone, and concluded the episode of projectile vomiting was life-threatening, and said Chol G had been given far more milk than intended, more than 40 mil. He accepted the events on September 21st were not as serious as those on September 7th. Dr Bowen said the feeds didn't add up, and the events of September 21st were strikingly similar to September 7th, but the consequences were not as serious for the September 21st event. Professor Arthurs said if a baby had been deliberately overfed, that would not necessarily show up on an x-ray. The judge moves on to the case of Child H. Child H was born in good condition on September 22, 2015 at the Countess of Chester Hospital, weighing 5 pounds and 2 ounces. Child H was very unstable into September 24, suffering desaturations, bradycardia and pneumophoruses. Dr Evans and Dr Sandy Bowen agreed Child H should have had surfactant earlier, and the judge says it is accepted that care was suboptimal. There was also an unacceptable delay in intubation. They said although the pneumophoruses were a complication, and some of the suboptimal care may have led to later pneumophoruses, none led to the later collapses of Child H, for which neither could find a cause. Child H was later transferred to Arrow Park Hospital where she improved and had no further cardiac arrests. She returned to the Countess of Chester Hospital on September 30th. Letby denied harming Child H. She raised the issue of suboptimal care, issues with the chest drains and said there was a cumulative effect for Child H which led to her collapses. The defence say an innocent explanation for the collapses cannot be ruled out. The judge details the events for Child H prior to September 26th, 27th 
which involved two chest drains being put in place in response to the saturations Child H had. The tip of the second chest drain moved around. In cross-examination, Dr. Ravi Jayram said the second chest drain tip would not come into contact with the heart and it was very unlikely it would come into contact with the sac around the heart. He had not heard of any event where that had happened. Letby had messaged colleague Sophie Ellis on September 25th saying it was quote, pretty bad so far how busy the unit was. In evidence, she said she had come across chest drains in Liverpool where the drains were stitched in, but not in Chester and no one seemed familiar. A third chest drain had to be obtained from a children's ward. Dr. Alison Ventures said the second chest drain on September 25th, 26th had almost fallen out and Child H's oxygen requirements gradually increased. Dr. John Gibbs said unusually Child H had developed another tension pneumothorax. The two chest drains were blocked with serous fluid and the third chest drain was inserted. Both Dr. Gibbs and Dr. Jayram said drains can become blocked. There was then a marked improvement, the judge tells the court, for Child H. At 3.22am on September 26th, Child H collapsed and full resuscitation began. Child H quickly improved and resuscitation was stopped. The cardiac arrest had no obvious pneumothorax and there was no evidence of fluid around the heart. Child H's temperature was normal. Dr Gibbs concluded the event was caused by hypoxia, lack of oxygen, but the explanation for that was not clear. Child H had chest drains and was deemed unstable for transport, so remained at the Countess of Chester Hospital on September 26th, 27th, when she collapsed at 12.55am. Dr Matthew Neem said his recollection was when Child H collapsed, Letby was neopuffing her. He assumed that she was Child H's designated nurse. It was, however, Shelley Tomlins who was the designated nurse for Child H that night. He noted thick secretions blocking the ET tube. Shelley Tomlins had noted Child H had a profound desaturation to 40%, despite equal bilateral entry and positive capnography. Let be in cross-examination was referred to text messages of her involvement with Child H that night. She said she had been assisting. Child H had another collapse at 3.30am and Dr Neem responded. He believed Letby was present. Child H was reintubated and her oxygen level and heart rate remained low. Dr Saladi had been called to assist with the resuscitation and contacted a consultant at Arrow Park as there was no explanation for the collapse. A blood test revealed a raised result for an infection marker, CRP levels, and Child H was transferred to Arrow Park. Let be in police interviews recalled caring for Child H as she had chest drains. She did not recall where she was when the first profound desaturation took place. She thought the cause could have been some form of airway problem. She was unable to explain the collapse and denied deliberate harm. She agreed she had searched for Child H's mother on Facebook but did not know why. Let be in evidence denied she was bored on her shift and said the timing of her text messages could have meant she was on a break. She denied having interfered with Child H's tubes on any occasion. Dr Evans said a deterioration of Child H would have been much more gradual if she had had an infection. He said a pneumothorax was a complication of Child H's clinical condition. He said the overall picture for Child H was that she improved significantly and quickly when responding to treatment. Dr Bowen noted the presence of respiratory distress syndrome and that had surfactant been given earlier, that would have reduced but not removed the likelihood of a pneumothorax developing. There was an unacceptable delay in the first intubation and the needle may have punctured lung tissue. The collapses on September 26th and 27th mirrored each other in having no obvious cause and were not quickly resolved, Dr Bowen had said. She could not identify any cause for these significant collapses. Professor Owen Arthurs said the radiograph images showed a recurrent pneumothorax. He said there was no ideal position for a chest drain. He said there was movement of the second chest drain. He said they are not generally known to cause bradycardias, particularly in neonates. The judge refers to the case of Child I. 
Born on August 7, 2015 in Liverpool Women's Hospital before being transferred to the Countess of Chester Hospital on August 18, where she was expected to improve with no ongoing concerns. Child Eye died on October 23rd. The prosecution case is on four occasions Child Eye suffered sudden and unexplained episodes as a consequence of deliberate harm by Letby. They say the final event caused her death and Letby is responsible for murder. Letby says she did not harm Child Eye on any occasion and whatever the causes of her deteriorations, she was not responsible. She said there were periods when Child Eye desaturated and was being treated for infection, suspected infection and suspected NEC. The prosecution say for three of the four events, Child Eye rapidly recovered and the other desaturations and infections are explicable. The judge refers to an event in late August 2015 when Letby was not on duty. Child Eye had a distended abdomen and an NG tube dislodged. Dr Bowen, in cross-examination, said this decline differed from later events. Child Eye had slowly deteriorated due to signs of infection and needed the use of a ventilator. Child Eye was returned to Liverpool Women's Hospital with suspected NEC. While there, she had a profound bradycardia, with her airway found to have large secretions in the ET tube. Child Eye recovered from the episode. The judge refers to the first of the four events on September 30th, when nursing staff were very happy with Child Eye at this point. Lisa Walker carried out a skin patch test on Child Eye that day, which she would not have done if Child Eye was not well. On September 30th, Letby was a designated nurse for Child Eye and two other babies in room 3. Letby said in evidence she did not do anything to cause the event for Child Eye. Dr David Harkness said in agreed evidence, other than being pale and a slightly enlarged abdomen, there was nothing to worry about. The judge refers to the target weight gain for babies. Child Eye was at the lowest percentile end. Dr Newby said Child Eye's weight was low and dropped down the percentile guidelines, but there had been numerous events in life when they had been unable to feed Child Eye due to abdominal distension. Dr Bowen said it was no surprise Child Eye's weight was low and Child Eye was unable to be fed as she had been ill. The judge says Letby had noted of Child Eye's abdomen, quote, Mum feels it is more distended to yesterday and that Child Eye is quiet. In evidence, she said Child Eye waking for feeds was regarding the 10am feed. At an addendum, Child Eye was, quote, reviewed by doctors at 1500 as she was mottled and monitoring was recommenced. There was no corresponding doctor's note. In evidence, Letby said she believed it had been a male doctor and it was the same name given when she was interviewed by police. She denied force feeding and causing a vomit for Child Eye. The mother of Child Eye had by the time of the desaturation left the unit and the father was at work. Child Eye desaturated and had a large vomit at 4.30pm after a feed recorded by Letby of quote 35 mil via NGT at 4pm. A doctor had made a note for Child Eye's event where Child Eye dropped to 30% saturation but by the time he arrived Child Eye was breathing well, was pink and the chest signs were clear. The abdomen was a little distended. Bernadette Butterworth recalled Child Eye's heart rate dropping and she desaturated. She required Neopuff. She saw Child Eye's stomach distending and milk and quote air plus 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 aspirated. Letby said she did not know why so much air was aspirated. She said in evidence she had not pumped Child Eye full of air. Dr Harkness saw Child Eye that night and Child Eye was breathing well for herself and a blood test showed no obvious signs of infection. However, she did not like being handled. Nurse Ashley Hudson noted Child Eye was stable on October 1st. By October 12th, Child Eye's feeds and weight were up, with feeds given every four hours of about 55 ml of milk. At 1.30am on October 13th, she took a 55 ml bottle feed. For the second event, the judge says Ashley Hudson noted Lucy Letby saying Child Eye looked quite pale. When the light was turned on, Child Eye looked very pale and the monitor was not sounding. Neopuffing was established, heart rate in 50s. 
Letby wrote her note later, and the judge says she would have been able to see Nurse Hudson's note at the time of writing. Letby quote, Child I noted to be pale in cot by myself. Senior Nurse Hudson present. Apnea alarm in situ and had not sounded. Minimal shallow breaths followed by gasping observed. Child I was given a blood transfusion. An x-ray showed quote, marked gaseous distension of bowel loops. A blood test showed no bacterial growth after five days. Ashley Hudson confirmed she had given Child Eye a feed at 1.30am and Child Eye seemed very stable and her waking for feeds was really encouraging. She had assisted Laura Eagles with a procedure for about 15 minutes. She would not have left Child Eye alone if she was unstable and would have asked a colleague to keep an eye on the baby. The other colleague on duty, Caroline Oakley, has no memory of being asked to do this. In evidence, Nurse Hudson said Letby was standing in the doorway, standing five to six feet away from the cot, the lights were switched off, and the corridor light provided some illumination. There was a canopy over the upper part of the cot, and blankets were on child eye. She switched the main lights on, and was closer to child eye than the defendant. She could see child eye was pale. She pushed back the canopy and blankets to tend to child eye. The apnea alarm had not sounded, and the deterioration was very surprising. Letby, when interviewed, remembered the event. She said when she and Nurse Hudson went into the nursery room, they put the lights on and saw Child Eye was pale. She denied injecting air into Child Eye's stomach. She thought they were at the doorway and had just put on the lights, and the nursery was, quote, never that dark that you would not be able to see the baby. In second interview, she said, quote, maybe I spotted something that Ashley wasn't able to. She said from her position, she noted child eye was pale. In her evidence, she was asked how she could spot something that Ashley Hudson couldn't, to which she replied, I knew what I was looking for. I knew what I was looking at, which she corrected herself. In evidence, she said she could not recall looking after child eye prior to this event. She recalled herself and Nurse Hudson going into room two together and could see Child Eye's face and hands. Child Eye was gasping and shallow breathing, so the alarms didn't go off. She remembered telling Nurse Hudson she looked a little pale. She said room two's lights were on a dimmer switch and it was not as dark as a photo identified by Ashley Hudson in evidence. Dr Elizabeth Newby said she was called to the room and as she arrived she passed Letby in the corridor. Resuscitation took place on child eye and it took 12 minutes before signs of life were detected. She said it was quote, definitely a serious state of affairs. The ETT was seen by Dr Matthew Neem to be too far in and the NGT was also not in the right position. By the following day, child eye was seen by Dr Harkness and assessed to be quote, sick but stable. The judge refers to the third event for Child Eye on October 13th to 14th. Child Eye was in room one. Dr. Neem reviewed Child Eye, who was, quote, settled and pink with breathing a bit squeaky, normal in ventilated babies. The abdomen distended but soft. Let be noted for Child Eye on October 14th, quote, at 0500 hours, abdomen noted to be more distended and firmer in appearance, with area of discoloration spreading on the right hand side veins more prominent. The judge says there are no corresponding medical notes for this. Child eye quote grimaced on Dr. Neem palpitating the abdomen which was noted to be mottled and distended. His impression was that the increasing abdomen distension caused the lungs to be squashed. The increased tenderness and skin discoloration stood out to him. He consulted Dr. J. Ram who was told of the distension and it was decided to continue with the ventilator settings. After Dr. J. Ram consulted Alderhay Children's Hospital, they said they would contact the Countess of Chester Hospital with a plan in the morning. Child Eye had a cardiac arrest at 7am. Shelley Tomlins noted Child Eye was pale and veiny with slightly greyish discoloration. Dr. Neem thought the swollen abdomen was squashing the lungs. By the time Dr. J. Ram arrived, Child Eye was stable. An x-ray showed no evidence of a pneumothorax. Let be in evidence said she did not have any recollection of the shift other than from the notes. She agreed the signs were initially good for child eye. She said she had not inflated child eye with air or sabotaged her. 
Child Eye responded very quickly to treatment and stabilised after being transferred to Arrow Park on October 15th. She returned to the Countess of Chester Hospital on October 17th. The trial judge is now referring to the fourth and fatal event. Child Eye was pronounced dead on October 23rd at 2.30am. Child Eye was not an intensive care baby, but was in room 1 as a precaution, the court is told. Designated nurse Ashley Hudson had agreed Child Eye was settled and stable the night of October 21st, 22nd. The following day, Child Eye remained nil by mouth and was unsettled at times, as recorded by Caroline Oakley, but settled with a dummy. Her cares were attended to by Child Eye's mother. For the night of October 22nd, 23rd, Ashley Hudson was again a designated nurse for Child Eye. Let be said, she did not recall in evidence much of the night shift when Child Eye died. She said staffing levels might have played a part. The judge says just before midnight, Ashley Hudson said Child Eye became unsettled and had very loud crying, relentless crying, something she had not heard before from her. Child Eye was put on her tummy and she became quiet and there were gaps in the breathing. Child Eye was turned over again and Nurse Hudson called for help. Let be said in evidence, she had not heard that crying. She said she became quiet and apneic. Dr Rachel Chang and Dr Gibbs were called and CPR began on child eye. She was ventilated and recovered. She was pale and mottled blue in her trunk. The colour steadily improved over five minutes and child eye became pink all over. It was decided to extubate child eye as she was fighting the ventilator, which is a good sign. Dr Gibbs was unsure what had caused Child Eye's rapid deterioration. He said he could not understand what natural disease could have caused it. A large stomach bubble was seen in an x-ray for Child Eye. Letby, in cross-examination, was asked about a record for one of her designated babies that night, the Stoke baby. The baby was noted by Dr Chang to be safe for transfer. Let B had noted between 10.50 to 10.52pm to commence 10% glucose for transfer. The IV fluid chart showed the start time altered from 11pm to midnight. In response to the allegation of falsifying records, Let B said the 11pm was an error which she had corrected. Nurse Hudson said Child Eye was behaving normally prior to the final desaturation. She did not recall how she was alerted. She said when she arrived at Child Eye, Letby was already there at the incubator. Her hands were inside the incubator with a dummy trying to settle Child Eye. Child Eye's crying was loud and relentless and Nurse Hudson was concerned Child Eye was going to collapse again. The nurse recalled she said something along the lines of she's going to do it again, isn't she? And that Letby replied she just needs to settle, she just needs to settle. Child Eye then collapsed. Dr Chang arrived at 1.12am and was joined by Dr Gibbs in trying to resuscitate Child Eye, who had mottling of purple and white all over. Efforts to resuscitate were unsuccessful. Melanie Taylor said they were all devastated and it was pure shock and this was the second death she had been directly involved in. She was never concerned about the treatment or care that babies received. Ashley Hudson was supported by Let's Be. The mother of Child Eye recalled Letby was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at Child Eye's first bath and how much Child Eye had loved it. Letby had said she was trying in that awful situation to create a positive memory for the parents. Letby was asked about a sympathy card she had taken a photo of for Child Eye's family on the day of Child Eye's funeral. She searched for the mother on Facebook on October 2015 and May 2016. Let's be said she did not remember if she was present when Child Eye collapsed and maybe she had gone to her after hearing her crying. She said the transfer process would have been stressful for Child Eye and believed the process was done too quickly. She said it was upsetting losing Child Eye and she regularly took pictures of cards she sent. She did not know why she had searched for Child Eye's mother on Facebook. She recalled settling Child Eye after crying, but did not know if this was after the first or second collapse. Professor Arthurs reviewed all the radiographic material. 
He said lungs were normal prior to the final collapse and it was quite unusual to see massive dilation of the stomach, which could cause splinting of the diaphragm. The post-mortem imaging showed dilation of the bowel and he said that was present before she died. He said there are not many conditions which cause dilation of the bowel. He said one of the explanations was air deliberately administered down the NG tube and that was his inference. Dr. Kokai carried out a post-mortem examination of child I. Dr. Andreas Marnarides was dependent on the report. Dr. Marnarides said child I did not have any C. He was very sceptical that child I died of natural causes. He said the collapses were more likely to be excessive air administered to the stomach via the NGT. The defence say a similar event happened for child I on August 23rd, a day when Letby was not on duty. Dr Evans said child I's weight gain could have been better and attributed that to her illnesses. He formed the view child I had received a large volume of air down the NGT. He said it would have to have been sizeable to cause splinting of the diaphragm. He refuted suggestions he had taken events from September to support a prosecution case, saying at the time of his report no one had been arrested. Dr Bowen said she too thought abdominal distension had splinted the diaphragm in the first event. She discounted NEC. Dr Evans said the second event was more serious. He refuted suggestions he had been looking for evidence to support the prosecution case. Dr Bowen said she was not sure if an NGT was in place at the time. There was no clinical need for one, but it was practice to keep one in place just in case. She accepted in her report that she said child I did not have an NGT. She considered air in the vein was a possibility due to the subsequent discoloration findings. Dr Bowen was accused of backing up Dr Evans. She refuted that, saying she was independent and had disagreed with Dr Evans on some conclusions. She said she had seen air embolus twice in babies in her career and explained what the symptoms were, saying the clinical presentation was wide and varied. She agreed there was nothing specific about discoloration that made it diagnostic of air embolus, but it was, however, consistent with air embolus. Dr Evans said for the third event, he came to the conclusion of a large volume of air administered via an NGT into the stomach. The response to child eyes resuscitation was not what he would expect. In cross-examination, Dr Evans said this was a separate event, not a continuation of an existing one. Dr Bowen concluded it was an air embolus caused by excessive air administration. For the fourth event, Dr Evans said child I was a stable baby prior to the collapse. He said he thought air was administered on this occasion via the blood. He thought the relentless crying, as described, was of a baby in pain and distress and there was no explanation for this. In cross-examination, he denied he was going for whatever mechanism that could support his explanation. He said if air was injected in the stomach as well, that was something he could not rule out. The judge refers to the case of Charles J, born at the Countess of Chester Hospital on October 31st, 2015. After a short time, Child J produced some brown bile and was transferred to Alderhey Children's Hospital for surgery. She had a perforated bowel and was fitted with a stoma. She returned to the Countess of Chester Hospital on November 10th and progressed well, moving into nursery room 4. She had issues with gaining weight, but hospital staff were not overly concerned. Nursery nurse Nicola Dennison said babies with stomas don't tend to grow very well. Child J's mother had stayed with Child J, giving cares prior to leaving on the night of November 26th, 27th. Letby was messaging a colleague prior to this shift about how nursery nurses should not be caring for babies with stomas, and there were issues with staffing, saying they would have to send some babies out to other hospitals. During the shift, Child J had two sets of sudden and unexpected desaturations, which required resuscitation. In the latter, there were symptoms of a seizure, something Child J had not had before or since. Dr Bowen said there was no cause for the events. Dr Evans said the infection could not be ruled out. The prosecution said Letby did something to cause deliberate harm. The defence say in the absence of any identifiable cause, 
the jury cannot be sure Letby did anything to harm child J. Mary Griffith recalled an event between 5 and 6am when she heard an alarm go off in Nursery 4. She saw Nurse Dennison had Neopuff on child J as she had desaturated. Dr Verhees recalled attending once at 5.15am. Swipe data showed him entering the unit at 5.03. He said he was told what had happened to child J, that child J had two profound desaturations, the first to 30s, the second to 50s. In the latter, child J was pale and mottled. He said at least one of those events was significant. Apart from child J's increased efforts to breathe, child J had recovered well. Child J was moved to room 2 where Letby was. Letby said it was widely talked about that nursery nurses were doing stomas when they shouldn't. She said it was a very busy time. Dr Gibbs was on the unit when child J desaturated again, this time with a falling heart rate. He said he assisted nurses Griffith and Letby. Dr Gibbs noted child J had desaturations to unrecordable levels. The first at 6.56am, the second at 7.24 plus bradycardia. They were associated with stiff arms, clenching of hands and on the second occasion the eyes deviated to the left. These were symptoms of seizures. The first took 10 minutes to settle and the perfusion was poor. The second took 5 minutes to settle, both requiring ventilation. Dr Gibbs could not explain the desaturations and child J had not presented with these symptoms before. He would say they were caused by a drop in oxygen, but the cause of that was not known. Professor Arthurs reviewed the images for child J. After the last collapse, the image was unremarkable. It could not assist in an explanation for this event. In police interview, Letby recalled child J as she had a Broviac line and stoma. She thought she only treated child J after the collapse. She said she had administered medication as Nicola Dennison was a nursery nurse and not qualified to administer such medications. She accepted searching for child J's parents but could not recall doing so. In evidence, she said she was aware of the second pair of events that she and Mary Griffith heard the alarm and saw child J fitting when they arrived. No one else was present and child J recovered. Dr Stephen Breary noted no blood glucose abnormalities to explain the seizures and there was nothing of concern in the blood results. Abdominal x-rays did not raise concerns and said it was a remarkable recovery for her. He did not understand why child J had been hypoxic. Letby was the designated nurse for child J the following night and there were no concerns raised. Dr Evans said the collapses were unexpected. The second pair were more serious and indicative of something wrong with the brain. He could not explain any natural process that had caused that hypoxia. Dr Bowen said infection was not responsible for child J's collapses and did not come to any major conclusion other than the deteriorations were sudden and unexpected. The trial judge begins referring to the case of child K. Born at 2.12am on February 17th, 2016, weighing 1 pound and 8 ounces. She was transferred to the neonatal unit prior to transfer to Arrow Park Hospital, where her condition continued to deteriorate, and the mother agreed, in the most heartbreaking decision of her life, to end life support for child K on February 20th. The prosecution say Letby attempted to kill child K within two hours of her being born, interfering with the breathing tube, causing her to collapse. There were two further collapses and the prosecution alleged they were sabotaged by Letby, but they are not the subject of charges. There is no expert opinion on Child K's case and the evidence is circumstantial, the judge says. The prosecution urged the jury to rely on inferences. The defence point to Child K's extreme prematurity and no direct evidence of harm caused. Child K was given surfactant late and the witness Dr Ravi Jayram's evidence is tainted and unreliable. Letby had no recollection of events but believed the ET tubes were not secured correctly. The oxygen saturation of 85% was good for child K minutes after birth for a baby of her gestational age and good enough to attempt intubation. Dr James Smith said if he had seen any evidence of trauma or bleeding 
he would have asked a consultant to step in and carry out the procedure. Nurse Joanne Williams said a team would carry out the procedure and the ET tube would be secured so the tube does not slip. Child K was transferred to the neonatal unit on a resuscitator with the plan to transfer to a tertiary unit. Mr Myers referred to a leak on the ventilator in his closing speech. An Alder Hay consultant said that air leak numbers did not tally with the high oxygen saturation readings for Child K. Joanne Williams said if Child K was not receiving the oxygen saturation required, the alarms would have gone off. Surfactant was administered, which Dr Smith agreed was late by 13 or 18 minutes, but would not have compromised Child K. Joanne Williams was Child K's designated nurse and left the neonatal unit at 3.47am, an hour and a half after Child K was born, to update the parents. She said she would not have left Child K alone if she was not stable and would have had someone to look after her in her absence. Dr J-Ram and Nurse Williams were happy Child K was quite stable. Joanne Williams said in cross-examination, the morphine infusion for Child K, timed at 3.30am, could have been at 3.50am. Dr J-Ram said he was aware Letby was alone with Child K and thought he was being irrational, but went to check on Child K as a precaution. Dr Ravi J-Ram said he walked into the nursery room and saw Letby by Child K's incubator, and saw Child K's saturation levels dropping to the 80s. The monitor alarm was not going off. He said, what's happening? Letby said something along the lines of, she's desaturating. Dr J Ram ascertained that ET tube was not working as it should, and Child K was ventilated. He said babies usually desaturate after about 30 to 60 seconds, so the cause of the desaturation would have started before he went into the room. Dr James Smith saw Dr J Ram on the right hand side of the incubator as he walked in. He reintubated Child K. The court had heard it was possible for a user to pause the monitor alarm for one minute. Dr J Ram was challenged about why he had not confronted Letby about her behaviour. He said it was not appropriate to raise concerns in medical notes. He said concerns were raised after this incident and faith was put in senior management to which Dr J Ram was told that it was unlikely anything was going on and to wait and see what happens. He said in hindsight he wished they had bypassed management. Dr J Ram said he could not remember the transport team note where he had written baby dislodged tube. He said it was highly unlikely child K had dislodged the ET tube. He accepted the note child K had been sedated after the desaturation but denied altering his account to fit the evidence. He said he had not seen the swipe data for timings. Letby in interview said she could only remember Child K because of her size. She did not recall Child K's tube slipping or any collapse. She agreed she thought Joanne Williams would not have left Child K alone if Child K was not stable. She could not remember if the alarm was silent, but agreed it should have sounded if Child K was desaturating. She thought it possible she was seeing if Child K was self-correcting. In evidence, she said she did not have any independent memory of Child K other than her being a tiny baby. She said although she had no memory of it, she said she would have waited 10 to 20 seconds to see if Child K self-corrected, as that was common practice. Elizabeth Morgan said in agreed evidence, it was possible for an ET tube to be dislodged in an unsedated and active baby, and a nurse would not leave a child alone in this situation if the baby was not settled. She said it would be good practice to observe the baby immediately and take corrective action if necessary if a baby of this gestational age had begun to desaturate. She believed it would not be normal practice to wait and see in a child of this gestational age with the lungs so underdeveloped. At 6.15am and 7.30am, child K desaturated again and it was noted that ET tube had dislodged again in the second event. Letby was on duty. The transport team arrived for child K, who required several rounds of treatment to stabilise her. She left having been stabilised at 12.50pm. The prosecution say child K was a settled baby who would not dislodge a tube. There was no record of an ET tube dislodgement at Arrow Park. Child K died on February 20th, 2016.
The cause of death was extreme prematurity with severe respiratory distress syndrome. Let B in further interview said she had no memory of Charles K's ET tube slipping and suggested it had not been secured initially. She accepted searching for Charles K's mother's name but could not recall why. In evidence, she said she had nothing to do with the events at 6.15 and 7.25 a.m. She agreed she had no reason to be in room 1 at 7.25 a.m. She said she looked up the mother as, quote, you still think of the patients you care for. She said the night shift was a busy one. The judge says the prosecution accept they cannot prove Letby's actions caused Charles K's death, but say she attempted to kill her. The judge refers to the case of Child L and Child M and their birth on April 8, 2016 at the Countess of Chester Hospital. The judge says it is alleged Letby tried to kill Child L by putting insulin into bags of dextrose. Professor Hindmarsh said the hypoglycemia episode for Child L lasted from April 9th to 11th and multiple bags had insulin added. He said a, quote, not noticeable amount of insulin, 0.1 mil, would have been added to the 500 mil bag, which would not change the colour. He was of the opinion that two or three bags, depending on how many bags were hung, had insulin added. He said while sticky insulin would account for some of the hypoglycemia, over time more insulin would have had to have been added via a bag. Letby worked four long day shifts from April 6th to 9th and had moved house during that time to Westbourne Road, Chester. She said April 9th was still fairly busy on the unit. After birth on April 8th, Childell's blood sugar was a bit low at 1.9. The court had heard this was normal for premature babies, so he was started on glucose. Reference to hypoglycemic pathway was mentioned that milk should be given to infants before an infusion of glucose. Neonatal practitioner Amy Davies said she had no concerns for child L regarding putting him on an alternative pathway. Dr. Bomick wrote the rate of the glucose infusion. Letby said glucose bags were kept in room 1 and insulin was kept in the equipment room. She could not recall if any of the bags were kept under lock and key. The first bag was 10% dextrose at noon on April 8th. Colleague Amy Davies denied administering insulin, saying that would only be given to babies with a blood sugar level over 12 and would only be prescribed by a doctor. This was the 60th case Dr Evans looked at, the court is told. He saw the relation between insulin and insulin C peptide in the blood plasma laboratory result for child L. He suggested to police a specialist should be approached to review his findings. Professor Heinmarsh said neonates have higher glucose requirements and any blood sugar level under 2.4 to 2.6 is a cause for concern, so it was appropriate for the initial dextrose infusion. For the night of April 8th to 9th, there were no concerns for child L and all the blood glucose readings were above 2. No fluid bags were changed during the night shift. For the day shift of April 9th, Mary Griffiths was the designated nurse for child L. She said he was stable. Professor Heimarsh says child L was hypoglycemic by 10am on April 9th and insulin must have been added between midnight and 9.30am. He said it is fairly easy to insert insulin into the portal of the bag via a needle. The judge says Professor Heimarsh said at least three bags contained insulin to maintain the low blood sugar levels for child L. The insulin could have been added to the bags at the same time, he added. He said once it was in the bag, it would not be known by smell or appearance. The type of insulin used was fast acting, the court was told. Mary Griffiths said it was quite a shock the blood glucose levels for child L dropped after the dextrose was administered. Let be said in evidence, she had nothing to do with insulin in the bags and could not assist with an explanation why the blood sugar level was so low. She said she had nothing to do with the bags prior to changing them. Mary Griffiths could not recall if the bag was changed. A plasma blood sample was taken, but podding was late, the court had heard, due to the collapse of child L's twin, child M. The evidence, the judge says, is the blood sample was taken between noon when child L had a 1.6 blood sugar reading and 3.35pm. The blood sample passed all the quality control tests and performance checks at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. 
The judge tells the jury, in short, there is no evidence to doubt the reliability of the test results. The insulin and the insulin C peptide results were the wrong way around from what they should have been. Childell's insulin level of 1,099 should have meant an insulin C peptide of 5 to 10,000, but it was 264. The court had heard said it was therefore synthetic insulin that was administered and to do so was dangerous. Clinical biochemist Dr Anna Milan said there wasn't anything that doubted the accuracy of the results. In cross-examination, she explained in the case of insulin, if the sample had not been treated appropriately, the insulin level would have been even higher, and insulin C-peptide was stable. Professor Heimarsh said the 1099 reading was a minimum, not a maximum. Let B in interview said the original blood sugar levels for child L were not a huge surprise for a neonate. She said very prolonged low blood sugar levels can cause brain damage and even death. She said it was not common for babies to be given insulin. She said they had access to the hypoglycemia pathway on the unit. She said any addition to an infusion bag would be very rare and have to be prescribed by a doctor and would have to be administered via syringe on the bag port. She replied, that wasn't done by me, to the accusation the bags had been sabotaged. She said an explanation would be that insulin would be in one of the bags and denied responsibility. The prosecution say there is uncontrovertible evidence Childell was poisoned with insulin before 10am on April 9th and accounted for persistent low blood sugar levels. They say this happened when Letby was on shift. Blood sugar levels improved on April 11th. The prosecution says from the second 15% dextrose bag on that day, child L was no longer being infused with insulin. Letby said the initial low blood sugar levels for child L on April 8th showed naturally resolving hypoglycemia. She accepted only she and Belinda Simcock had been on duty for the child F and child L events when the babies first had serious low blood sugar readings. She denied doing anything to harm child L. The judge refers to the case of child M, who the court had heard was not an intensive care baby, but put next to child L on April 9th. At 11am, he had a small posset, as noted by Mary Griffith, and 1.5ml of bile-stained fluid was aspirated at 12.30pm. Child M was to be nil by mouth, a decision made by a registrar. At 3.45pm, Child M received antibiotics, the prescription by Letby and Mary Griffith, and administered by one of the two nurses. At 4pm, Mary Griffith had been preparing a 12.5% dextrose infusion for Child L. The parents had left a few minutes earlier. Child M collapsed at this time. Letby said, quote, Yes, it's an event, it needs to be sorted. And the resuscitation call was put out. Dr Jram was crash bleeped. A nurse colleague said her role was to draw up the resuscitation drugs. She was shown a piece of paper towel referring to entries on clinical notes for times and medications administered. She recognised her handwriting of, quote, adrenaline made. That note was subsequently recovered from a Morrison's bag in Letby's bedroom at the time of her arrest in July 2018, along with a blood gas record for child M. The nurse said the practice was to put the note in the confidential waste bin or the clinical waste bin where it would be incinerated. The judge says it is the prosecution's case that let's be recovered the note from the bin afterwards. Child M was not breathing for himself and required doses of adrenaline in the resuscitation, which lasted under 30 minutes. They reached a point, the judge said, where Child M might not survive. Then Child M suddenly picked up his breathing and heart rate. Dr Jram said he saw pink patches blotches on the abdomen of child M that moved around. He noticed it was similar to what he had seen with child A. He first mentioned this in his witness statement. He said his priority at the time was communicating with parents and post-resuscitation care. He said himself and his colleagues sat down on June 29, 2016 to discuss the findings. Dr Jram said someone mentioned air embolus. He researched it in literature and he shared that research the following day with colleagues. In cross-examination, he said he had not appreciated the clinical significance of the skin discoloration at the time. 
He rejected the assertion he did not note it at the time because it did not happen, or that admitting it was incompetence. He said at the time there were other things going on. He agreed that after Child D had died, Dr Stephen Brewery had carried out an informal review of events at that time, and that Letby was associated with those events. In police interview, Letby denied doing anything to harm Child M. She did not know why Child M desaturated. She said she had been drawing up medications at the time of the collapse. She thought she had taken the paper towel home inadvertently, not emptying her pockets. She said the paper towel might have been put to one side. She denied she had kept it to keep a record of the attack. In evidence, she said Child L and Child M stood out as she had been the allocated nurse for when they were delivered. Child M was not in an allocated space on the nursery, she recalled, and maybe things would have been different if he had been in an allocated space. She did not recall seeing any discoloration, did not recall having any description of skin discoloration being mentioned to her, and any discoloration would have been difficult for her to see. Letby said her taking home the notes was an error and denied taking them from the confidential waste bin. She added she cared for the twins on subsequent days quite frequently, during which time there were no adverse incidents. Paediatric neuroradiologist Dr Stiveros provided agreed evidence in which he said Child M had shown signs of brain damage likely caused by the collapse on April 9, 2016. Professor Owen Arthurs viewed radiographic images for Child M and said they could not support or refute an air embolus. Dr Evans concluded there were no concerns for Child M prior to the collapse, save for one bilus aspirate for which he was put nil by mouth. He did not believe that caused a collapse, as Child M's stomach was empty. He believed a noxious substance, or air, was administered to Child M's circulation, i.e. intravenously, and could not explain a natural cause for Child M's rapid recovery, ruling out infection. He said that taking into account Dr J Ram's description of the skin discoloration, the cause for Child M's collapse was an air embolus. In cross-examination, he accepted there was no empirical research for how air dissipated in the body following a collapse and based it on physiology that cardiac massage would dissipate it. He said if the air goes around the abdominal area, it would result in skin discoloration, and if it heads towards the brain, it can cause neurological damage. He said very little air is required to cause collapse. Dr Sandy Bowen said Child M had no markers of infection. She had to find some way to explain how a baby previously well suddenly collapsed and had prolonged resuscitation for which she almost didn't make it, then recovered rapidly. She said the skin discoloration seen by Dr Jram was compatible with air embolus. She said the actual volume to cause a baby to collapse and die is unknown. She said if it was a small volume, it would take some minutes to get to Child M in this case, as he was on a slow infusion. In cross-examination, Dr Bowen accepted most babies die in the case of air embolus, but it was not inevitable. She could not think of an alternative medical cause from her differential diagnosis. She said the type of cardiac arrest suffered by Child M was incredibly unusual. The judge refers to the case of Child N. Born on June 2nd, 2016, at the Countess of Chester Hospital. He says the prosecution case is Child N had three unexpected collapses in June 2016, that they are all attributable to inflicted trauma by Letby and were acts carried out with the intention to murder him. The defence case is Letby did not harm Child N, that there are inconsistencies in the accounts and the jury cannot be sure Letby intended to murder Child N. Child N had intermittent grunting, and it was recorded at 3.10pm on June 2nd that he had a desaturation to 67% for a minute and was crying, as recorded by Nurse Caroline Oakley. He was placed in a hot cot and reviewed by Dr Yuko. The nurse said she had no recollection of events other than that in her notes. There was nothing to suggest the nasogastric tube was moved after it was placed, or that there were difficulties placing it on Child N. For the night of June 2nd to 3rd, Christopher Booth was the designated nurse for Child N. Let B have messaged a colleague to say they had a baby with haemophilia, and in evidence said staff were panicked by this. 
The prosecution say Letby was messaging a colleague constantly from 8pm while feeding a baby in a nursery, which was a two-handed job. She refuted a suggestion in cross-examination that she had force-fed her designated baby at the time, saying the note of the feed must have happened at a different time. Dr Jennifer Lockerhan reviewed child N and saw he was pink and well perfused, and consideration was given to starting enteral feeds. Christopher Booth had no concerns as he went on his break. He handed over care to a nurse when he went on his break at 1am, but could not remember who that was. The other colleagues could not recall caring for child N. Child N had a deterioration to 40% at 1.05am, a significant desaturation, and child N was, quote, screaming, Dr Loggerhan had noted. She said she had no direct recollection of that, and said she would not usually have written that word. At 2am, child N had recovered, was settled, and was asleep. Christopher Booth recorded there had been no further episodes for child N following that desaturation. The baby remained nil by mouth. The prosecution case is Letby sabotaged child N in some way to cause the collapse. Letby said she had no memory and did not know child N had collapsed. She said she did not believe it was a collapse which required resuscitation. She denied using the absence of Christopher Booth as an opportunity to sabotage child N. The prosecution say the second and third events for child N happened on June 15, 2016. There had been no concerns for child N on June 14 at handover for the night shift by nurse Jennifer Jones Key. At 1am, child N was pale, mottled and very veiny, with slight abdominal distension. He was reviewed by a doctor who observed mottling, a potential sign of sepsis, but was otherwise normal. On further observation, child N had five minor desaturations which had resolved and the mottling had gone. Child N's oral feeds were stopped and he was given antibiotics and glucose. The defence say these were signs of child N deteriorating. At 7.15am, child N had another desaturation. The prosecution say Letby, who had arrived early for her day shift, did something to cause the collapse. Letby said she had gone to see child N as she had had him the previous day shift. The profound desaturation caused child N's heart rate to be affected. A male doctor had been called to attend child N and recorded a desaturation to 48%. He decided to move child N to nursery room 1 and attempted to intubate. He saw blood which prevented him from seeing the airway. The back of child N's throat looked unusual with swelling and he was not sure where the blood was coming from. He made three unsuccessful attempts to intubate and suction did not clear the view enough. He remembered Letby was helping with the attempted intubation. A chest x-ray confirmed no pulmonary hemorrhage. The trial judge says Letby in police interview said she remembered child N had an unusual airway issue and was very difficult to intubate. She was asked about intensive care charts and references to blood. She said if the NGT had been inserted forcefully, it could cause about one mil of blood. She did recall child N bleeding at the time of intubation, but was not sure why. In her second interview, Letby said she would arrive prior to 7.30am for her day shift. She went to talk to Jennifer Jones Key, her colleague. She referred to her colleague's note of child M being pale and veiny overnight. His condition deteriorated. In cross-examination, it was put to Letby that observation charts showed nothing deteriorating for child N. Letby said she was stood at the doorway and child N's deterioration happened within minutes. He was bluish and not breathing. For the intubation, Letby recalled blood being seen, and her interpretation of the note was blood was seen once intubation had been attempted. In the family communication note, Letby wrote parents were contacted, phones were switched off, and a message was left. In cross-examination, Letby agreed she had written out the 7.15am instant, as she had taken care of child N from 7.30am. The first time she recalled seeing blood was after the second desaturation at 3pm for child N. The judge says there was a dispute over previously agreed evidence on who made a call to child N's parents. A further desaturation happened at 2.50pm after the parents left the ward. Dr Mabry was crash called to child N who had desaturated. 
He could see vocal cords, but there was substantial swelling in the airway and did not recall seeing any blood. Dr. Saladi recalled seeing blood in the oropharynx and blood in the NG tube. Chalden was later intubated successfully by the Alderhey transport team. Chalden continued to have episodes of apnea, but they were less serious and recovered at Alderhey. Let be noted, quote, approximately 1450 infant became apneic with desaturations to 44%, heart rate 90 beats per minute. Fresh blood noted from mouth and 3 mils of blood aspirated from NG tube. Neopuff commenced and doctors crash called, unable to obtain secure airway. She said after the 3 mil aspiration of blood, she had some memory of events. There was a sense of panic on the unit and it was chaotic. She said there was no factor 8 left, so some was brought over from Alderhay. She said child M was the focus of the whole unit at that point. She said she was stressed and anxious as they couldn't get an airway. Professor Sally Kinsey gave evidence on haemophilia and the purpose of factor 8. Child N had moderate haemophilia and would need factor 8 when it was required, not on a regular basis. She did not see any issue of child N's blood which caused her collapses. She said a spontaneous bleed could not be explained by haemophilia as a baby could not damage themselves in the throat and any instrumentation could potentially cause bleeding. A pulmonary hemorrhage was not a viable explanation. The defence do not suggest it was spontaneous bleeding or pulmonary hemorrhage. They point to when witnesses saw the bleeding. Child N was the 29th case Dr Evans looked at. The event on June the 3rd was unusual, particularly the screaming and crying. He said something must have been done to him and it was not an air embolus. For June 15th, Dr Evans said the bleed was a consequence of trauma. Dr Bowen said the June 3rd desaturation was life-threatening and she had never experienced a baby crying for 30 minutes or screaming. She said child then had received a painful stimulus. For June 15th, she believed the bleed was a consequence of trauma. Today we'll see the conclusion of the judge's summing up of the case after which the jury will retire to consider verdicts on the 22 charges, 7 of murder, 15 of attempted murder. The judge refers to the cases of child O and child P, two of three triplets born on June 21st, 2016 at the Countess of Chester Hospital. Child O died on June 23rd and child P died on June 24th. Child O weighed 2.02 kilograms and was admitted to the neonatal unit. From about 5pm on June 21st and through June 22nd, there was nothing remarkable about Child O's condition. Letby was on holiday from June 16th to 22nd, during which time she had gone to Ibiza. In text messages, Letby inquired with a male doctor about the triplets and said she felt at home in ITU and the girls knew she was happy to be in room 1 of the neonatal unit. Child O was moved from room 1 to room 2 during June 22nd and was very stable, the court is told. Overnight on June 22nd to 23rd, Child O was recorded as having partially digested milk in aspirates, which was normal and a stable night with a full abdomen at 7.30am, showing no concern. Let be, accepted that child O was fine on June 22nd and the night of June 22nd to 23rd. She was the designated nurse for child O and child P on June 23rd, along with another baby, all in room 2. In police interview, Let be said the babies were in the high dependency room and the ratio should have been one nurse to two babies. Let be was the only designated nurse in room 2 for that day, plus supervision of student nurse Rebecca Morgan. Nurse Melanie Taylor confirmed there were no issues for child O at the beginning of the shift. A doctor noted child O's abdomen was full but not distended, soft, not tender, and he was making good progress at 9.30am. Prior to the collapse of child O, Melanie Taylor asked Letby if he should be moved to room 1 as he looked unwell. Letby did not agree and said he should stay in room 2. Melanie Taylor said she was put out by this. Lucy Letby, however, did not recall being dismissive. Letby recorded feeds for child O at 10am and noon. A note by a male doctor at 1.15pm recorded a distended abdomen and a vomit after a feed and ordered an x-ray. 
Let be noted child O quote, reviewed by the registrar, had vomited undigested milk, tachycardic and abdomen distended. NG tube placed on free drainage. Saline bolus given as prescribed along with antibiotics. Placed nil by mouth and abdominal x-ray performed. Observations returned to normal. An entry on the blood gas record by Letby said Child O was on CPAP when he was not. Letby said she meant CPAP via Neopath. Dr Bowen said she could find no record of Child O being on CPAP for this time. In interview, Letby recalled Child O's abdomen becoming distended and him being intubated. She did not recall who was present when he vomited. Melanie Taylor said Child O collapsed at about 2.40pm. When she went to nursery too, Letby was already there and a doctor arrived after. Letby said she discovered the collapse after hearing his monitor alarming and he had a quote blotchy purpley red rash kind of mottling. She said mottling could be a sign of infection or cold. Child O was moved to nursery one. The doctor's note of the event was a desaturation and bradycardia. He was mottled and the skin looked unusual. Chaldo was bagged and transferred to room 1. He was intubated at the first attempt and connected to a ventilator. The doctor went to speak to the parents. Letby noted Chaldo was quote mottled plus plus with abdomen red poor perfusion. She said she did nothing to Child O to introduce air and said two prescriptions on the neonatal schedule of her co-signature were for after the collapse. The doctor noted a quote very very rare purpuric rash and good perfusion and child O appeared to stabilise. Letby said she did not see the type of discoloration the doctor did. At 3.51pm child O desaturated again to the 30s. Quote, chest movement and air entry observed minimal improvement. Doctors were crash called and child O was reintubated on the first attempt. He had another desaturation at 4.15pm and resuscitation efforts were made. There was no effective heartbeat and the abdomen was still distended. The rash had disappeared which perplexed the doctor who had not seen that kind of rash before or since. Care was withdrawn and child O died. Dr Breary said it was deeply distressing for all involved as child O's deterioration came out of the blue and they excluded all natural causes. He later held a debrief at which he said Letby did not seem upset. Letby said she was shocked and upset at Child O's death which was unexpected and there was an element of delay when getting a registrar called to the room. She remembered Dr Breary inserting a drain into Child O's abdomen which was swollen and red. She had not seen that procedure before. She said everyone was completely flat after Child O died. Chaldo's father described the stomach swelling up and looked like he had bad prickly heat, like you could see something oozing through his veins. Letby said she didn't see anything like that. A female doctor was quite upset and very apologetic at Chaldo's death and could not explain it. Dr Breary told the court senior people at the hospital could not believe someone was trying to harm babies. He said there had been a meeting and when it was put to him about Letby's association with the events, he had said something along the lines of, it can't be Lucy, not nice Lucy. He said senior clinicians were becoming increasingly concerned about the deaths. It was his opinion that there was not an increasing range of acuity of babies being treated and was wary it was a chicken and egg situation where because of the unexplained incidents that were happening on the unit, the baby's care needs became more acute. He said he wanted to escalate the situation properly in the hospital rather than by going to the police. He said Letby rejected his suggestion to take time off after Child O died. The Countess of Chester Hospital was redesignated as a level 1 unit by its own decision on July 7th 2016. The number of cot spaces was reduced from 16 to 12 and the gestational age limit was raised from 27 weeks to 32. Dr Kokai carried out a post-mortem examination. Dr Marnarides reviewed and said injuries to the liver were the result of impact trauma. He said during treatment small bruises could be caused to the surface of the liver and would not be extensive. He says the liver is not in an area where CPR is applied. 
He has only seen this kind of injury to the liver before in children, not babies, from accidents involving bicycles. He did not think CPR could produce this extensive injury. He also found internal gastric distension and concluded there had been an air embolus. Professor Arthurs also referred to radiograph images taken post-mortem. He said the gases were an unusual finding. Dr Evans said the air was excessive and could have been administered via the NGT and the skin discoloration was symptomatic of that. He said the bleed in the liver would also have contributed to the collapse. He could not find any evidence where the air embolus came accidentally. Dr Bowen said the cause was excessive air down the stomach via the NGT causing an air embolus and could not see any innocent cause for that. She refuted the accusation from the defence that she was striving to support the case against Letby by supporting Dr Evans. The prosecution say the jury can exclude natural causes and Letby cause deliberate harm to child O. The defendant denies wrongdoing and the defence say it was a natural deterioration and the liver injury was caused during resuscitation. The judge refers to the case of child P, born in very good health. At 10am on June 23rd, Dr Cook recorded no concerns. Dr Gibbs recorded child P had active bowel sounds and a full, mildly distended abdomen. He said child P appeared very well and should continue on NGT feeds if there were any concerns for him to be fed intravenously. There was no suggestion of infection for child P. Sophie Ellis was the designated nurse for child P on June 23rd, 24th. She had learned that child O had died on June 23rd. Child P's observations were in a normal area and Sophie Ellis recorded a desaturation which resolved and a low-lying heart rate. For feeds, child P was on two hourly feeds up to 8pm on June 23rd with trace aspirates. At 8pm, Sophie Ellis aspirated 14 ml of milk with a pH of 3. She fed him a further 15 ml milk feed and placed him on his tummy. At midnight, a further 20 ml acidic milk aspirate was taken. Feeds were stopped and child P was put on 10% dextrose infusions. The last update on the night shift was abdomen soft and non-distended for child P. Nurse Catherine Percival Calderbank had said let be found working there was boring and she tended to move back to the other nurseries and colleagues were concerned for her mental health as those units could be distressing and exhausting. Let be in evidence said she never found nursery work boring and did not recall having a conversation with Catherine Percival Calderbank to say otherwise. In interview, Letby said she wanted to be designated nurse for child P that day to provide continuity of care. Full blood tests were ordered for child P. Dr Yuko said child P was to be monitored as he had a distended abdomen. 20 minutes later, at around 9.50am, child P desaturated. Rebecca Morgan said she recalled all the alarms going off and she helped Dr Yuko taking the top of the incubator off. Dr Yuko said he and Lucy Letby were in the room when child P collapsed. Arrow Park provided advice for treatment of child P. A poor blood gas result showed child P had respiratory acidosis. He had a poor heart rate and poor perfusion. Child P was sedated and paralysed, which Dr Bowen said was entirely correct. At 11.30am, child P desaturated again and he was given CPR. Spontaneous circulation was restored. A female doctor could not understand what was going on. Upon saying the transport team from Liverpool were arriving to transfer child P, Letby had said words to the effect of, he's not leaving here alive, is he? The female doctor replied, don't say that. She thought they were doing well at that point. In evidence, Letby said she could potentially have said that at the time and that both she and the female doctor were both stressed. Let be said from her recollection, there was no reference to a tube dislodging for child P. There is no evidence of anyone checking if it was blocked when it was removed. A radiograph image taken at 11.57am had showed a pneumothorax, which was not a tension pneumothorax. A male doctor's recollection from 12.50pm was that it was very, very busy for child P and the plan was to insert a chest drain. There was no apparent cause for what was going on clinically, the judge tells the court. 
Let be said she recalled the pneumothorax and there was a general decline for child P. A miscalculation had been made where the adrenaline doses were higher than they should have been, but a doctor from the transport team had previously told the court that they found no sign of child P being impacted by that. Child P's mother said child P's stomach looked the same but not as swollen. The father said the scene in the unit was one of pandemonium. A female doctor was very apologetic to them, saying they would get to the bottom of what had caused the collapses. The third triplet, who was stable, was taken to Liverpool by the transport team. In evidence, Letby said she had been involved with administering a lot of medication and did not recall seeing any discoloration. She said there was relief on the unit when the transport team turned up. She said there was discussion if there had been a bug on the unit. After the deaths of child O and child P, the consultants insisted Lucy Letby was removed from the unit and resisted attempts to bring her back, the court is told. Dr Marnarides said he had no evidence to indicate a natural disease that would account for child P's death. He thought small hematomas to the liver were potentially the result of CPR or as a result of prematurity and did not have enough to say it was an impact injury. He said there was no clinical evidence for a natural cause. He said having considered other accounts, he concluded there was gastric distension caused by excessive air injected into the stomach. Professor Arthurs reviewed radiographic images for child P. He said the gases shown were unusual for a baby who did not have natural diseases. He said it was consistent with air administered. Dr Evans was at a loss to explain how child P had collapsed. He had believed the cause was complications from the pneumothorax. There was no credible natural cause. In cross-examination, he said an experienced or competent nurse or doctor would not cause a liver injury in resuscitations. He said child P could have collapsed from doses of air administered and denied shifting his account to fit the evidence. Dr Bowen was concerned about the x-ray for child P on the night of June 23rd and the air present. Overnight, child P became intolerant of feeds. She said attention should have been paid to the x-ray, which showed a pneumothorax earlier. She said the air in child P's abdomen from the night before was abnormal and had been introduced at some point or points via the NGT, splinting the diaphragm. She could not think of any natural occurring phenomena that accounted for the subsequent collapses. The judge now refers to the case of child Q a baby boy born on June 22, 2016 at the Countess of Chester Hospital. He weighed 2,076 grams at birth and required breathing support. He was taken to the neonatal unit. The judge says there were no signs of infection. Three days later, on June 25, child Q had a profound desaturation and vomit. The prosecution say this was liquid and possibly air being forced down the NGT. They say possible mild NEC would not account for the type of desaturation and recovery. The defence say developing NEC cannot be excluded. For June 23rd to 24th, Tanya Downs was designated nurse for child Q. She noted coffee ground style amounts of bile in child Q. 1.5 ml of bile was aspirated at 4am. The nurse recalled child Q had to be readmitted in July 2016 with gut problems at the Out of Hours Clinic. Let be noted, quote, 0910 child Q attended by senior nurse Lapalinen. He had vomited clear fluid nasally from mouth, desaturation and bradycardia, mottled plus plus. Neopuff and suction applied, registrar attended. Air plus plus aspirated from NG tube. Let be said in police interview, she had returned to nursery 2 to see child Q being tended to by nurse Lapalinen. When asked about the air in child Q's stomach, she said sometimes babies gulp when they vomit and there could have been a blockage in the bowel. She said she would not have left room 2 if child Q was not stable. She denied causing child Q harm or leaving the room so she had an alibi for the incident. In evidence, she said child Q had a low temperature and was concerned about that. She said she arranged with nurses Lapalinen and Griffith for when she went to nursery one and was there for a few minutes. For the 9am feed for child Q, the oxygen and saturation levels are missing. She said those omissions were a mistake. 
She said the baby in room one was an intensive care baby, so she could not leave that baby for very long. She said she had no part in giving Neopuff after child Q needed oxygen. She said she was told Air++ Plus Plus had been aspirated from the NG tube. She said the collapse, relatively speaking, was not serious. A male doctor was called to the unit. He noted as a result of the Neopuffing, child Q saturations returned to 100%. The baby was moved to room 1 and put on CPAP and given antibiotics as a precaution. He was presumed at this time to have sepsis. A blood test could not give a reason for the vomit, the judge says. A chest x-ray showed a trace fluid and no suggestion of a large amount of foreign matter or a sign of infection. Dr John Gibbs said the collapse did not fit with a baby who was tired. It was decided to intubate child Q and put him on a ventilator. A female doctor examined child Q, noted the blood gases were acceptable. Child Q was very unsettled at times, but there were no signs of concern, she recalled. She saw a sign of respiratory acidosis and the ventilator settings were changed. Amy Davies said child Q was restless at times. On June 26th, child Q showed a loop in the bowel. Arrangements were made to transfer child Q to Alderhey Children's Hospital. A consultant there stated in agreed evidence that child Q had been admitted due to concerns over his deteriorating condition. When assessed, child Q was stable and his abdomen very slightly swollen. By the night of June 26th, he was assessed as very stable with subtle signs of NEC and was taken off the ventilator by June 27th. The decision was made to transfer child Q back to the Countess of Chester Hospital on June 28th. Dr Evans and Dr Bowen had considered the possibility of NEC. Dr Evans said although there were markers of child Q having infection from the bile aspirates and not really tolerating feeds, it did not explain the sudden collapse at 9.10am with a very significant deterioration. It was not clear how to put it all together. He said child Q would not have vomited anything at all unless a lot of clear fluid had been forced down the NGT, possibly with air as well. He said once Chol Q had vomited, he recovered. He said in relation to the Air++++, plus plus plus, there was very little neopuffing taking place. He said when babies vomit, they do not swallow air. In cross-examination, he accepted he had initially concluded Chol Q had received air and not fluid. The Air++ plus plus was, quote, noteworthy. Dr Evans refuted he had added the liquid element to support the case. He said the evidence he had heard from the people looking after child Q had been a great help in forming his opinion. He said the presence of NEC or otherwise could not be discounted, but that would not cause a sudden collapse, and noted the rapid recovery of child Q and no further gastrointestinal problems until his discharge from the Countess of Chester Hospital in July 2016. Dr Bowen noted that aspirates were not uncommon for child Q prior to the collapse. She did not know where the fluid plus 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 came from for child Q from the notes. Child Q's intermittent air was unlikely to cause the quote air plus plus aspirated. She concluded child Q had been given air down the NG tube which had distended the abdomen so much, squashing the lungs, causing mottling. In cross-examination, she agreed mucus plus 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 being aspirated could cause problems with breathing. She said there was not a cause of where the mucus plus 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 would have come from. She refuted the possibility of any baby sucking in air during a vomit. She added aspirates was a sign of NEC as well as other factors. She said it was not a diagnosis of NEC. She said child Q got better too quickly for it to have been mild NEC. After Letby was taken off nursing duties, she filed a grievance with the hospital in September 2016. She said that time was emotionally difficult and had left her feeling isolated. The judge says searches of Letby's home in Chester and Hereford were carried out in 2018 and 2019 respectively. He said there were various papers collected, including, quote, not good enough and I am a horrible, evil person. The defence says these were notes written by someone who was distraught at what was happening and was being unfairly targeted. The prosecution say the notes are by a troubled person who was in part confessing to what she had done. 257 handover sheets were found at Letby's Chester and Hereford homes. 
21 of which in relation to babies in the indictment. In relation to a note filled in on both sides, Letby said she had written it as, quote, everything had got on top of her and it made her feel guilty and isolated and she was blaming herself. She thought the police would be involved and she would lose her job. She thought she was being victimised by Dr Ravi Jayram and Dr Stephen Breary. She said despite what she had written, she had not killed them on purpose. She said she was career focused and the note, I am evil, I did this, was how the situation had made her feel. She said that year was difficult as there were more babies being admitted to the neonatal unit with more complex needs, such as chest drains and stomas. Staffing levels were quite poor at times, and she was doing a lot of additional shifts and overtime, and did not believe there was much support on offer. She said the handover sheets she had taken home in her pocket were kept for no particular reason and she did not know how to dispose of them. Letby had said ideally handover sheets should be put in the confidential waste bin. She said she hardly ever looked at them. In evidence, she confirmed she bought a shredder and only shredded bank statements. The handover sheets and notes were insignificant. When asked about Child M's blood gas records, the note taken home was an error on her part and said the sheets had no meaning to her. In a 2019 police interview, she identified a support network of free nurses and a doctor that she had after being removed from nursing duties. She had said she was not really aware of air embolisms and could not recall any specific training in that. In her 2020 interview, Letby was asked about the diaries. She said she thought she started documenting names amid concerns of the rising number of babies dying. In evidence, she said she had liked all the doctors at the hospital. She said she was worried she was in trouble as she may have made a mistake in the care of child Q. She accepted in an email she had written she was having a quote plus plus meltdown. In messages to a colleague, she accepted reference had been made to Air Embolus and had filled a Datix form on July 1st 2016 in which she cited an open port had a potential risk of Air Embolus. She denied she was covering herself for a cause of accidental air embolus. The judge says the jurors have to be sure of the defendant's guilt, her character and any inconsistencies between evidence given by the defendant and any witnesses. The judge says if jurors are sure that two babies had insulin administered to them deliberately, they have to consider whether that was a coincidence or whether it was done by one person, and if so, who. He says there were common features among the cases that the defendant was on duty for each event. He refers to the note that Nicholas Johnson had made, which was a list that included five babies had unusual bleeding, eight had discoloration. The defendant said she did not see discoloration or there was no discoloration to be seen. Five babies' collapses happened within moments of a nurse going on break. Four of the babies were screaming crying uncharacteristically. Four babies recovered after being taken to another hospital. Three cases were where Letby was accused of behaving inappropriately after the baby passed away. The prosecution say these are not unconnected events and say that insulin, air embolus and post-mortem findings can make the jury sure of Letby's guilt. Letby denies doing any harm and the searches and keeping of confidential documents had nothing sinister. The handwritten notes were a product of despair. The defence say the jury cannot be sure in any event of Letby's guilt.